Hello and welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast, where we explore the myths and legends of Northern Europe from an archetypal perspective. I'm Luke DeWolf. And I'm Dan Larrabee. Today we're continuing our series on the Poetic Edda with Harbardziot, the taunting of Thor by Odin. This is a really, really interesting story that's going to contrast the personalities of Thor and Odin through a really interesting kind of setup where uh, where Thor is on this journey and then Odin is kind of in disguise and is blocking his way. We'll, we'll get into that kind of right away there, but uh, it's a, a, a story about uh, the two of them kind of exchanging insults, heated words, as it says here in the Jackson Crawford translation, and uh, well, we're really going to see some of their deeds and uh, their personalities, and uh, it's not very flattering for either of them in in some sense. So, um, Dan, do you have anything to add to that? Well, it's uh, I, I'm I say this all the time, but I'm excited to uh, get into it. Uh, it's a very interesting poem, uh, partially because it's a, a flighting poem, and it's sort of a, a Norse rap battle in that they're going to see what they can do to insult each other in the best way possible and you know who's going to come out with the upper hand. So yeah, no I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. Definitely. And uh, again, I think uh, the the idea here is really to show the difference in their personalities because the situation is kind of contrived. I'll I'll talk a little bit about what I think about that at the end because uh you know, we'll want to see the story play out sort of thing, but uh yeah, it, it, it's Interesting is definitely a good word for it. I know we've we've said that a, a couple of times already, but it's it's a, an interesting situation, and uh, Thor and Odin are are going to get into it. And uh, I'll just mention that this poem appears in both the Codex Regius, which is the source of most of the Poetic Edda, as well as Manuscript AM seven forty eight I four T O. So it's good that uh, it's in more than one manuscript, uh, as always. When it's only in the one, that's the only place where we have it uh, kind of available here. So it's always good to have confirmation that uh, this poem is in more than one place. But uh, yeah, without further ado, I think uh, we can just get into it. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, and I suppose uh, we'd be remiss if uh, didn't mention that we are reading the Poetic Edda translated by Jackson Crawford. So thank you to him and to Hackett Publishing for letting us do that. It's a great translation, very readable, very understandable. And uh, we'll have a link to where you can purchase it from Amazon if you like to follow along with us. So, Okay, I think we'll uh, just dive right in. Yeah, sounds good. This has a little prose introduction again, and so I'll go through that and then straight into the story. So this is Harbard's Ljod. The Taunting of Thor by Odin Thor was coming back from the east and came to a fjord. On the other side of the fjord was a ferryman with his boat. Thor called out, Who is that man who stands on the other side of the fjord? The other man answered, Who is that man who calls from across the water? Thor said, Take me across the water and I'll give you some breakfast. I'm carrying a basket on my back, and you'll find no better food. I ate in peace before I left home. I had some herring and goat, and I'm still full from that. What do you think of that, Dan? Well, it's kind of a... It's a... like a Boring isn't the right word, but just sort of a weird, like... Yeah, Thor's walking on the, you know, down the road, and he had to get across a fjord, and there was a ferryman, and so he calls out and says, hey, if you give me a ride, I'll, I've got some breakfast for you. Pretty mundane, yeah. Pretty mundane. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, complicate it up as much as possible, of course, because that's what we do here. But uh, as soon as I'm seeing this, I'm seeing Thor, who, who's kind of this ultimate symbol of order he's you know he's god to the common man friend to humans uh he protects humanity he and his his weapon is a is a hammer it's a tool rather than like a sword or a spear and so there's this idea that it's civilization that he's providing it's prosperity it's it's all the prosperity and safety that civilization provides for people and so we have 
all of that wrapped up into the the god of Thor, and he's trying to cross some water, which is sort of the I don't know the the one of the universal symbols for the unknown and let's let's say uh i I've been struggling with the idea of chaos because we always have to explain like there's good chaos and bad chaos so i i i heard i heard a term i think it was from Jordan Peterson of course, but uh undifferentiated chaos which so it's good and bad and you know, when you order it, you can sort of separate out the two. So I'm probably going to be saying undifferentiated chaos a whole bunch from now on because it, it really like, for me, it was like, Oh, that's how I can easily explain it. Yeah. Good. That's uh that's a good clarification. I know we, we've certainly had some trouble with that in the past. So for sure. Yeah. So no undifferentiated chaos, it, you know, within like 20 episodes, we'll just be, be saying like, yeah, so it's, you know, you see, and you well, see, <laughs> and, but, uh, so we have we have him wanting to cr- cross basically through the unknown to the other side, and he offers the ferryman so the mode by which he's going to uh, cross in, through the unknown. Basically, all of the the best things about living in a stable uh, hierarchical society. He you know he ate he ate his breakfast in peace. Like first of all. We take that like for granted in a crazy way, like that we don't we don't even think about that. We just we're up, and then it you know a little. We have the luxury of being kind of groggy, and it's like don't talk to me before the first coffee. You eat breakfast, and it's you know it's peaceful. And he's talking about eating goat and herring, like that's meat. That that is like if you're going to kill a your goat for to eat, that means you've got other goats because you know you wouldn't you can get milk from a goat like that. It's sort of the golden goose, right? So you've, you've really just got this, uh, incredible wealth that he's willing to share. You know, I've, I've eaten in peace. I've, I've had this herring, this goat, you know, I've got this wealth that I, I can do that and I'm willing to share it with you. And it's kind of the, and he's still full from that like that. Oh, this is, this is the life right here. And so he's offering that and, he, and it's, it's funny because he, we've talked about this before where when you're confronted by, by chaos, undifferentiated chaos, one of the ways through it is you, you have to make sacrifices to be, to make yourself worthy of ordering it and getting the gold from it, getting the gold from the dragon, all that kind of stuff. What he is offering here it's not really a sacrifice. It's more of a, it's more of the, the benefits of, of the society. I mean, he, he's already satiated, so there's no hardship for him. It's just here. I can, I can give you this. It's more like a tribute, more like a, more of a sharing rather than a sacrifice. He's not being hard done by at all. And, uh, yeah, so it's just, it's interesting to see like, this is what he's doing. And, as we as we're going to see, I think we will discover what the difference between like sacrifice is versus like just a, an easy gift to give. Yeah, very good point, and and I and I do want to mention. Uh, I I think this is still in the spirit of of hospitality in general. It's it's not so much like the idea of you know someone is coming into your house and and then you have to provide hospitality, but it's also just that idea of you know if someone is doing something for you, you reciprocate sort of thing. And 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 so yeah, I mean it's it's entirely possible that it could be a hardship on Thor later because it's food that he won't get to eat later but i think the assumption here is that he's he's giving it away freely he's offering it freely and he expects to get to his destination in time for his next meal that's i think what this would imply anyway by him offering that so freely so yeah again it's just that he's he's prepared he's he's prepared for his journey he's he's got surplus so yeah it's it's like he's been enjoying the the fruits of his and his society's labor and yeah he's got all this extra stuff and he wants something so he can offer it to the ferryman i mean that's the basics of the barter system right there essentially is just uh you know someone provides a service you provide him something that he wants as well he or she and then off you go right but uh well i mean i mean 
Thor obviously is in a good position, as you said, to be able to take advantage of that. I do want to uh, set the scene a little bit just as far as, uh, you know, if you're painting a picture for yourself, the idea of uh, of a fjord, if you've got a particular image in your head of a fjord, which for the most part we associate with Norway, even though technically in a geological term it can be in a lot of different places, like, uh, well, most coastlines that kind of have the same similar characteristics have fjords as well. but uh, in in Norway and in in Norse, the word fjord can mean more than just what we consider a fjord. It's it's not just these tall, steep mountains that kind of jut down into the water very steeply, sort of thing. It's uh, it could also be just any kind of long, narrow strait of water. I believe I'm I'm kind of getting that correct. And and I can give an example. Actually, there's um. Not necessarily a relatable example, but I can give an example. There's a, uh, the capital of Norway, Oslo, is said to be at the end of the Oslo Fjord, which is not a fjord in the sense that we consider it a fjord. It's not this big steep thing. It really just is kind of this strait of water that ends in this in this city, and uh, you know you can see for a very long way, and there aren't any of these kind of mountains around nearby. So that's just to give an example of how the word could be, and. To me, it's more plausible that there would be a ferryman taking you across a fjord that looks kind of like that because you're not necessarily having to climb down and then up a mountain. That probably isn't the easiest way of getting around something like that. Just, you, you know, a point there for saying the scene. But entirely possible that that's how that would work in general, but but still, it's it's most likely just this long body of water that would take a while to get around anyway. That's... Uh, a while before it would be passable by some means other than a ferry, as an example. And, and that's that's important. That's going to be important, right? So, um, no, I, but I think you uh, you got, uh, you covered pretty well everything else that I was uh, was looking at. So, shall we move on? Actually, there is one thing I just saw in my notes. I think it's setting up an interesting... Well, we're going to see the uh, the difference in personalities, but I think there's an interesting dichotomy in that I think Thor is going to come off as more like small C conservative and and Odin will be more small L liberal. And I, I hesitate to use those terms because they're so charged in politics. Uh, but what, what I mean by that is that uh, Thor, Thor has created a hierarchy that society is using and that um, is obviously working because he's able to eat in peace at home. And, you know, and I'm assuming that uh, the others who live in his society are able to do pretty much the same thing for, for the most part. Um, and then, and if you look at, at personality uh, traits like the big five, more conservative is uh, more orderly and more industrious. So you, and those those are exactly the fruits of orderliness and industrious industriousness is the the homes and the peace and the sort of the wealth because you have that everything is ordered up. Um, whereas Odin, as a ferryman, he is uh, sort of traversing the the unknown back and forth and sort of able to able to deal with it better. He's able to. He's able to manage the the chaos, the undifferentiated chaos, and to I don't know if you can ever like master it without ordering it, but basically he's able to sail a ship across it. I think that's actually like as far as a metaphor goes, and what's happening in the uh, the story. I th that's sort of exactly what's going on, and you obviously uh, you obviously need both for a society to. Uh, to thrive because that's how you, you need that strong foundation to be able to um, make innovations that, you know, <laughs> aren't going to take everything down just because you think it's a good idea. It's like, Oh, let's try this. It's like, well, no, like we've gotten this far knowing what works. Like we're, we're doing pretty good here. Okay. Now, well, what if we, what if we tweak this? Okay. Oh, that didn't work that great, but you know, it didn't, it didn't take the whole thing down. So I think that's sort of the, the proper, uh, the proper way to look at it. And I, I think we're seeing that kind of the, these two forces in, in their personalities. Sure. No, no, a uh, great point. I, I do want to mention here, we're never going to 
uh, understand explicitly that this other man here is Odin. So I just want to say here that it's it's understood that this other guy here is Odin, and it's going to take us even a, a little bit actually to get to get to his name even. So I'll I'll just be clear: it's not a spoiler or anything like that that we're talking. This is Thor. This is Odin. Thor is clearly stated, and his he is named as Thor. And this other man, this fairy man, it's Odin. Just and Thor doesn't recognize him. That's also clear. At possibly. least not at the beginning. Yes. And uh, actually, that's interesting. There is, there has been debate whether it's uh, Odin or Loki, but I think most people fall on the side of Odin, especially because when Odin uh, sort of uh, rhymes off his various names and uh, like Grimnismal, Harbard is one of them. So yeah, so we're 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 pretty much. Uh... Let's just all be clear about that, that that's who we are talking about. And so it's, it's not a spoiler that we're talking Thor and Odin. That's, that's just kind of understood here. So anyway, no, no, great point. And uh, I think we'll just get more evidence for that small C conservative versus small L liberal as we go here. So Sounds good. Yeah, uh, I think we'll move on. So this will be stanzas four and five. Back to the poem. The ferryman said, You're boasting about your breakfast, but you don't know if your homecoming will be glad. I think your mother is dead. Thor said, You are telling me news that would seem bad to anybody that my mother is dead. That escalated very quickly. <laughs> no, there was no build up to that at all, right? Like, no. <laughs> hey, I think your mom's dead. <laughs> Not, not even any provocation. I no. mean, right? Like it's... And we kind of see this... I mean, I, to be fair, I've, I think I've seen one rap battle in my life. But, and I haven't seen uh, 8 Mile. That's, that's the only exposure I have to that myself, so... But from what I understand, and I think you can see this throughout history, that insulting uh, someone's mother is a fairly common... It's a very common thing because mothers are cherished and why wouldn't you go after what someone cherishes when you're insulting them? And so this is just a, an example of, of flighting and the, you know, the exchange of, you know, insults and, you know, witty repartee, I guess. Still though, I mean, he skipped, he skipped fat. Went all oh yeah, he went to dead. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, I skipped fat, skipped uh, like your mother's a whore kind of thing. Yeah, I'd right to just know she's dead. <laughs> and when you get there, what uh, what I think this this means on the more archetypal side is that that it, the society has kind of lost that. Maybe not lost, but it. it it's not as innovative as it could be that the, the mother of what well, we even call it the mother of invention, the mother of invention, it, it, it's stagnating. It could be, there could be more, there could be more of an infusion of that, that creative energy. And, you know, because of, because Thor puts so much, puts things in orders sort of, uh, unrelentingly, then you know his you know his mother might actually be be dead and society might actually be stagnating yeah and i mean it's no secret his mother is earth i i mean that's that's one of those old ideas that comes from well the fertility cults that would have been kind of the underpinning of all the major religions that we know about kind of had that as as some kind of stage and so the idea of Thor being born of the earth, it's, it's very much a, a fertility thing. And so if his mother is dead, if the, if the earth is dead, the, the creative force that provides all the fertility f for the possibility of growth, that would actually be quite serious. On the, on the hand of this being sort of an insult battle, yeah, there's, there's that meaning. But maybe kind of from a, on a, a, general, a generalized perspective here, this is kind of like, to me, this is like you don't know the situation you're going to return to. You're out at a journey, and but you you don't know what's going to be there when you come home. I mean, today in the in the the age of being fully connected, all times, you know, everyone's got their phone, everyone's texting all the time. You know, maybe it maybe it is hard to know that 
Well, well, it would be really easy to find out bad news quickly while you're out and about on your workday sort of thing. And it's not like something you have to wait to get home. But maybe not. Maybe it's the case of, you know, you're a family member has dropped dead and you're the one to find out when you arrive home. Maybe it's something like you've got some kind of uh, complacency about yourself if you are out kind of in the world in the unknown and you're expecting to return to some circumstance, but always be mindful that it, it could change. And maybe that's kind of a wariness of when you go back home, at least survey your surroundings sort of thing. That's the takeaway I got from that. And also the just the contrast in their character versus Thor's kind of happy, cheerful, here, I've got some food to share with you versus the, the, the ferryman, Odin, is uh, quite pessimistic, to say the least. Not very hospitable either. No, no, he uh, he very much. Uh, yeah, he, well, he's, he's quite rude. He's like you're, you know, you're boasting about your breakfast that it, it just seems like it's uh, it's very rude. And I don't know. E- either way, Thor Thor brushes it off though. It, it it's not like he's he's gullible or naive. Like I think he's sort of saying like, well, anyone would find that bad. Like what what like in some ways I think like well how am I going to know it's I've got to get home to find out. So common yeah, sense in, in some ways there. I think so. Yeah. But anyway, this just kind of sets the, sets the tone of these, these two characters. And I mean, I don't think we've ever been portraying Odin as cute and cuddly and likable or anything like that, but still he's, uh, he's definitely, uh, presenting a certain image even all already. And it's going to get worse. It always does. <laughs> always. Shall I move to the next one? Yeah, let's go. Stanza six and seven. Back to the poem. The ferryman said, You don't look like a man who owns good farms. There you stand, barefoot like a beggar, not even a good pair of pants on. Thor said, Row that boat over here. I'll show you the landing. Who owns that ship that you're on? So Thor is basically doing like, let me talk to your manager. <laughs> Which, you know, that's the very ordered way of going through this. He's been insulted by this, you know, lowly employee. And he's like, okay, let me, let me talk to your manager. You're, you're kind of being a jerk here. I wonder if the, the things that the ferryman said, uh, you know, you don't look like a, a man who owns good farms. Well, and standing like a, a beggar with not even a good pair of pants on. It's interesting because we've kind of already established that actually he does have good farms and, and this wealth. So it's, uh, it's kind of just an insult for an insult's sake. And we could, we could look at it that maybe, you know, if, uh, maybe it's, maybe he is wealthy and everything, but it's, it's not, he's not as wealthy as he could be if he had more of this um, creative energy going into the, into the society. Uh, he's just saying it in a really like jerky way. And, uh, and then Thor's like, yeah, you know what? I'm done. Get me the manager. It's pretty funny. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think th- there's a lot of ways to look at, well, I mean, he's, he's pretty directly questioning Thor's status. Right. And I mean, on one level, I think anyone who, who gets their situation, their status, their worth questioned is going to kind of take the insult and take that personally. But I mean, there's there's a few ways to look at it. I mean, first of all, maybe Thor is a relatively simple guy. Maybe he doesn't wear flashy things. He's He's got simple things that he, that all, all that he, he needs. I mean, maybe he is barefoot and isn't wearing a good pair of pants. But that's just the way he travels. That's it's possible, and, and I mean that would speak to just a humility of character, and you know, not flaunting one's wealth, which I I think maybe is in the Havamal somewhere. I don't know, but um, e- either way, it's 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 like uh, questioning if he owns good farms is is questioning. The, vali- the validity of the, the society that Thor is supposedly representing. And, and I think that questioning is, is something that Odin generally does. He, he wants to safeguard the society. He wants to 
improve it and make sure that it's going to continue to last. And I mean, that's there's a hint of that here, but again, we're it's very much in the in the sense of Odin is being a jerk and Thor kind of I mean, on the one hand, maybe he sort of he just he he brushes it off as well. It's like, well, okay, you're being insulting, but I still need to get across. Bro, it over here. Just stop talking. Like, but yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty funny here. <laughs> Let me speak to the manager. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. But um, do you have anything else here? No, I think we can move on. Okay, eight through eleven. Back to the poem. The ferryman said, A man named Hildolf asked me to run the ferry, a wise and provident man who lives in Rathseljasund. He asked me not to give rides to beggars or horse thieves, only good people and those I know well. Tell me your name if you want to cross the fjord. Thor said, I'll tell you my name. I'm no criminal and I'm from a good family. I am Odin's son, Maile's brother and Magni's father, warrior of the gods. You're talking to Thor here. Now I'll ask in turn, what is your name? The ferryman said, Greybeard is my name. I rarely lie about that. Thor said, Why would anyone lie about that except to conceal some crime? I really like the this exchange, I, and I like, I love the uh, the line like, "Oh, Greybeard's my name." I rarely lie about that, but it's like, okay, but you do, <laughs> you do lie about that sometimes. So, I'm going to start off with the the man who is employing uh, the ferryman, uh, Hildolf. Uh, Hildolf means a uh, war wolf, and. I think that's a, I think that's very interesting, mainly because one of the, I guess, best ways to take a stagnant society and make it vibrant again is to put it through a war. And there are, I was about to say, there are tons of benefits to society to go through a war. That's not, not what I meant. There are, there are, but there are many things that come out of war that are, that end up being beneficial because generally technology makes leaps and bounds and there's kind of a, there is a shakeup to society and they have to reconfigure after the, the war is over. I mean, I don't have to explain why war is bad because of all the death and destruction, but there are, but it, it is kind of that idea that, you know, out of destruction, there can be creation. And so you, you do see that, I mean, the, the explosion of technology in the 20th century in the Western world, you know, pretty much directly comes out of World War I and World War II. Like World War I, there's, a, there's kind of this boom of technology, and then World War II like, took that boom and then just exploded even further. And, and you know, kind of pun intended, because you, like the atomic age was one of those huge things that really... Uh, well, it, it obviously changed the world, and we're all we're all living the the benefit and the the product of that, right? Well, yeah, and I mean the the the, the name the, of the Cold War, like calling it the Cold War, it's it's appropriate on so many levels because it it really had the same function as a war. There was an arms race going on; technology was being pushed by both sides. Huge, huge, huge advances happened during the Cold War. And again, that that wouldn't have happened without World War II going the way it did. That definitely wouldn't have happened without World War I going the way it did in many, many different uh, respects. Uh, go check out uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History Blueprint for Armageddon if you want to know way too much about World War I uh, than, uh, than you would ever need to need to know. But uh, no, exactly. It's like it's that's what comes out of out of war and uh i mean a good reason to look at something like uh hardcore history or something like that he emphasizes all the negatives that come from war as well so it's again it's not like it's a it's a good thing but i i think a, another um another thing that i've i've heard is that the reason for 
the the strength of nation states in Europe is because they waged wars against one another first of all for a very very long time like this this didn't start in World War 1 I. I think the last major war was in something like the 1870s I think that was the Franco-Prussian war which resulted in the the unification of Italy something like well started the unification of Italy there was a series of wars on that um prior to world war one but before that there's napoleon before that there's what uh, tons of wars i don't know about and uh that was happening for years and years and years and then a, a, a big reason why there isn't that strength of kind of national spirit sort of thing is one and i'll get this out of the way that borders were drawn up in a very haphazard manner by colonial powers and that's kind of its own issue but Groups within these nation states were fighting against each other, and that just cripples a country because it's not the entire thing kind of getting together and working towards a common goal, which a war against any other major power is a big deal. And for the most part, especially in Africa, say, or even today with uh, with Syria and Iraq as a as an example with ISIS sort of thing, it's it's wars waged internally and not as a result of uh, you know two competing powers waging war together and and that's a big reason for the kind of lack of national cohesion and even possibly the the lack of development civil wars don't result in this same advancement because both sides destroy each other and you don't really get anything lasting but if it's if it's something like world war 1 world war 2 the benefit if you're willing to go there is this big leap in quality of life after things are pretty terrible during and like right after as they're rebuilding like it takes it takes a while to get back but it does there does seem to be leaps and bounds because the things that they developed during the war to kill other people they're like oh we can also use it for this and it turns out to be like really good and you're like oh well that's weird but well, and aren't there still parts of like uh, France and Belgium and stuff that are essentially no go zones because there are not that kind, never mind there that are no go zones because of like millions and millions of uh, of shells that are unexploded that are still in the Absolutely. ground sort of thing that they haven't cleared up like Verdun is one example the area around it anyway that hasn't been cleaned up even uh, Vimy Ridge like if you go to the, um, the memorial site you have to stay like on the path in a very well marked out area because there are landmines and unexploded shells, you know, everywhere else. Like it's crazy. Oh, yeah, it's really like nuts to think about that. It's been a hundred years. Yeah. Uh, like, like virtually we, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's been a hundred years since any of those major battles happened anyway. Like, uh, right now this is like, we're, we're August, 2018 right now when we're recording this and it's like a hundred years prior to that, the war was kind of in its final stages. There wasn't any more of these gigantic battles with like millions and millions. Of, well, I mean, probably there were, but still it's, it, it's not like all, most well, of the major no, like, battles are done, right? Yeah. Cause it would have been November, 1918. And there weren't a lot of, there were more skirmishes leading up to that. Like yeah, Germany was done. Yeah, and everyone kind of knew that the war was over. Just the leaders weren't, uh, <laughs> they couldn't get around to like talking to each other and sort of crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And uh, yeah, like there were still skirmishes, but no one really wanted, everyone knew the war was over. No one really wanted to fight. So there was less of a compulsion to fight. Yeah, it's just all to say it's it's been 100 years and this stuff has not gotten cleaned up. And so it's like... And how would you really... It's just well, yeah, yeah. There's there's some speculation or whatever. It's going to take decades, decades more of actual effort, and you you know, put a fence up, and no one's allowed to go there forever. That's also easy enough. But anyway, that's a that's a a, a big tangent. Go listen to Blueprint for Armageddon Hardcore History. It's it's a it's a good listen. Definitely, if you enjoyed this little diversion. <laughs> Getting back to the uh, the poem, the it's interesting. There's the emphasis emphasis put on uh, saying the name and criminality, and I I think that comes from uh, if you were if you were a criminal and and an outlaw, 
they would uh you're supposed to be you were out you're cast out of society and like if, if you found if you found one of these people the idea was you had to kill them because well they're they were cast out for a reason right they were harmful to the society so you had to uh you had you had to kill them and if you wanted to keep living well then you'd probably take another name and and there wasn't the uh if you went far away enough you could use a different name and people wouldn't wouldn't know who you are or your family and that kind of thing so it would uh, it would protect you it, yeah just having having your name not be known was a protection for criminals so that's yeah, what we're seeing here yeah yeah no no fair enough and uh I think here another another side to that as well is that like Thor doesn't see why anyone would conceal your name. So so that almost speaks to kind of the, the naivety of too much order as well because it's it's kind of like he lives in a society where no one would have to do that or no, no one would think to do that something like that. And and I think the implication is something like he's already cast out all of the criminals sort of thing and they're not around and he doesn't really see that why so why would anyone conceal your name and then thor is insisting he's not a criminal he he lists his entire family not well the entire thing would take a long time but he he lists his family tree which is a way of you know proving beyond just this is my word sort of thing this is like i can name my family members i can name their accomplishments if you want me to like this is who i am and this is my lineage this is my connection and that's supposed to give some legitimacy and then you know you get just graybeard which is where which is harbard which is where the the name of the poem comes from harbard's the, the old it's it's harbard's um i forget what it, the lay of harbard i think is what it would translate to literally something like that but anyway um yeah the whole thing again is just it's another contrast odin as harbard or graybeard is willing to conceal himself and again that's kind of like by concealing yourself he's sort of the implication i think is he's he's doing things that require concealment anyway and then thor is just this big upfront guy and very proud of his uh his name his lineage nothing to hide he just says it there's good reason to conceal your name not conceal, more like not to give too much information to someone you don't know, right? But Thor, that's not his thing. He just, this is who I am. Here we go. Yeah, exactly. It uh, it really shows the, I would say, the difference between Thor and, and Odin or, or Greybeard in, in this case. That one, is, one is willing to kind of bend the rules to their own benefit, whereas Thor doesn't bend the rules. And we've seen that before where, um, how, like how angry he got in the Voluspa when there were lies, there was, I guess there was a recommendation that, uh, the Aesir lie to the, the Vanir about the negotiations on how to end the war. So. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the, the contrast between the two of them is, is, I mean, there's, there's going to be more, but, uh, but already we're, we're, getting into some of the major differences between them and, and just the, the idea of a name, right? Like, I mean, how there can be so much difference there. I think it's a, it's a good distinction, right? So, um, shall we move on? Yes, let's go. Okay. Stanzas 12 and 13. Back to the poem. Greybeard said, whether or not I committed crimes, I'd still want to defend my life against people like you, unless my fated day had come. Thor said, It seems like a shame for me to wade over there to get at you and get my pants wet, but I'll pay you back, slanderer, for those nasty words if I get over this fjord. So we now have Thor... Uh, willing to inflict physical harm on on the ferryman for not uh, well, one for being a jerk, and uh, I think also for not coming over and ferrying him across the ford. So it's um, I, I think again we're just seeing the contrast between between the two, and that he's seeing that 
this uh, this person is being unhelpful and sort of an unknown quantity and he's like okay well i will i will make you a known quantity i will put you into order with my hammer like this isn't uh this isn't hard like i i can do this I, i'm just gonna you know straighten you out hey that's even like we we have that term now right like you're going to straighten someone out and there's usually a, an implication of physical harm that you're going to visit upon them yeah and i mean uh the, the funny thing here is that he, he probably can't just wade over that's i mean sort of if if you could just wade over this this part easily there wouldn't be much need for a ferryman and thor wouldn't be kind of getting all so so i think that's an empty threat first of all it's like it's not necessarily that he can just get over to the other side here but he's he's getting affected now which which i think is is where a reasonable person would start to get affected is like someone's not backing down they're continuing to be insulting continuing to act like a jerk i mean there's anger in the sense of you know i'm i'm going to physically harm you for this sort of thing and maybe that's not necessarily ethical especially this day and age but you know it, at least the sentiment of of getting annoyed and getting angry is sort of like maybe thor was a bit annoyed before but now he's like he's he's properly angry here uh odin i'll say odin throughout this whole story by the way i i yeah make, it makes it simpler here odin says why he might necessarily conceal his name which which we were talking about before a little bit but it's like you know he he's saying it's not whether he he committed a crime he would still want to defend his life which concealing your name is one method of doing that which is like if you are in a situation where someone knowing your name could put you into harm's way the wise thing to do in that case would be to conceal your name or use a, an alias or something like that that's going to get you through and i mean that's not necessarily something you have to do today especially not if you're a good upstanding citizen and that doesn't really prove odin's point all that well but you know concealing other things like your your personality like switching to kind of a different uh, way of of speaking or acting when you're in a situation that it would not be so appropriate to act the way you normally do. That's one method of kind of concealing yourself, your identity sort of thing. And I mean, I think that's just one example of, of how this could, how this could work today, because it's, it's not necessarily the same thing where possibly, you know, you would get into a blood feud or something like that. If you let your name be known in the wrong village sort of thing, that's not really something we we've got necessarily, but we do sort of have these situations where it might be good to not be upfront yourself all the time. At the very minimum, don't do it unless you're Thor who can defend himself physically. Right? For sure. No, it's, um, you know, the, the first, uh, the first line of the, the Havamal is about checking out your surroundings. Are you surrounded by friends or foes or do you even know? So, it, it's good to always be uh, to be cautious about your surroundings and who you're with. Yeah, definitely. So I mean, uh, again, it's it's the contrast of the two of them as far as their personalities go, and again, it it just it puts uh, it puts Thor into the light of like he he's willing to always be upfront and maybe is not keen to the possible issues of doing that. Versus Odin, on the other hand, is kind of concealing himself and. I'll say charitably that he's being frustrating. Anyway, I think we can move on. Let's move on. All right. Stanzas 14 and 15. Back to the poem. Greybeard said, I'll stand right here and wait for you. I think I'll be your toughest enemy since Hrungnir. Thor said, You want to talk about when I killed Hrungnir? That arrogant giant with a stone head? I knocked him down and laid him out flat. What were you doing meanwhile, Greybeard? So th this is, uh, it's funny because we're getting into the, you know, oh, I beat up this guy and what do you think I can do to you? It's, it's, a, it's trash talk. It really is. Like when they're, they're talking about insult, poetry, and, and flating, like 
it hasn't changed all that much. I mean, you could watch any press conference before like an ultimate fighting event and you'd see a lot of these same things here. Um, and I, I think in some ways what we're seeing is Thor trying to prove what well, he's trying to prove his worthiness to Greybeard to Odin that, you know, I can do this. So what, like you should come over across the fjord to get me because you know, because I did kill this uh, giant, and I, I think we'll eventually cover that uh, that story in uh, probably the prose edda, right? Yeah, yeah. As I understand it, this whole story is from the prose edda, and uh, I mean, we've got a ways to go, but we'll we'll certainly get there. The, the, well, there are plenty of stories referenced in the poetic edda um, th- that are expounded upon in the the prose edda, and if, and if you Listen to our interview with Professor Caroline Larrington. She went into very good detail as far as, you know, why uh, Snorri Sturluson, who put this all together, is, you know, a good, reliable source as far as, you know, he wanted to preserve these stories and, and we can kind of take them at face value at a minimum. He he might have done some minor adjusting here and there, even smoothing things over to make kind of better sense sort of thing. But, uh, you know, he certainly wasn't uh, defacing the the stories and so i mean when it's when we've got it in the prosetta and we're going to cover it in the prosetta then that's yeah that's definitely worth doing uh i i had some details about the story but i don't know if you want yeah no totally just just some some minor things so hrungnir the the definition i got was brawler and i mean so first of all that's that's already kind of like this is a righteous enemy for thor like a, a brawler doesn't necessarily deserve to be put down, as in permanently, but it, it, it's someone you need to deal with as far as, like, he, he's someone who's picking a fight with everyone in the bar or everyone in the mead hall or whatever, and definitely needs to be, uh, well, calmed down. And Thor's method of calming someone down tends to be with a hammer. He knocked him down and laid him out flat. So that's just it. Uh, theoretically, uh, Rungnir had invaded Valhalla and Thor deals with him. And so I, I put invaded in quotes as well. So that's just invaded. Like you can invade Valhalla. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, again, this is just to show that Thor is a defender. He's, he's capable. He's, he will defend the known space with his life essentially like he will put his his life on the line his body on the line and physically take care of the threat and uh he's capable of doing that because he's still here and he's got plenty of stories that he can brag about not just this one and and i thought it was kind of interesting that that odin actually kind of like he brings it up he's he says i'll be your toughest opponent since this guy it's not thor saying well I killed this guy. I, I thought that was interesting anyway. It's more like his deeds are well known. Just like anyone's deeds would be well known to their father. But still, it's he doesn't know that. So anyway, his deeds are well known. Thor's deeds are well known is what I take away from all that. For sure. Something else that I was, I was just thinking about. If we're looking at... You know, we're, we're seeing if we're talking about Thor as sort of society and civilization, and, and then uh, threatening, threatening Odin. And it, it is interesting because the story that uh, Odin is referencing is kind of proves Thor's point that he could go over and you know and straighten him out. It uh, it kind of reminds me though of when there's a. I guess a kind of a, like a revolution going on in a society or something, something that's new and big enough to cause like a social disturbance. The society will generally protect itself against it by, by using the, the its force. So, um, think, think of any time that in, in history, a revolution or revolutionary ideas have happened. the, I guess the uh, the incumbent power will use martial force to put it down, and we're ki- we're kind of seeing that now. That you know, uh, with if we take Odin to be this sort of liberal and you know uh, 
sort of flirting with chaos force at offering these new ideas. Well, it's kind of like if you want to get to the other side of this fjord, you're going to have to move through these ideas. And if like, if you can't drive the ferry yourself, Thor, and you, you know, you beat me to a pulp, how are you going to, you're not going to be able to get across anyway. So I think there is sort of that, that line between making sure that your society doesn't devolve into chaos when there's revolutionary ideas that come through, but also um, making sure that there is room for that innovation. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's a different perspective of doing it, right? I mean, because for all that we say that Thor is this paragon of order sort of thing, he still goes out into the unknown and, and journeys and things like that. Like, he, he, he goes and puts himself out there. We'll, we'll hear more about that directly, but... I mean, he's he's ostensibly there now. He's in he's in the unknown per se. He goes out there and he he is a hero and he goes and and destroys the enemy. But it that that's very it's very like I'm going to put order into the world around me through force. And I mean, what's funny is that Thor might be kind of this likable character, especially in this thing. We we sort of start out with Thor as the protagonist of this story if you can even say that but he's this likable guy but the way he he works in the world is not really as nuanced as we would necessarily consider acceptable these days i mean it it isn't acceptable in foreign policy for a country to just go and put order to the world we even see that like the united states doesn't do that anymore like they do they don't do that effectively anyway and and i mean maybe you could talk about how there's well half measures don't get the job done and and yeah there's there's a side to that but still like the the foreign policy for a long time was very much you know soft power sort of thing and then nuanced and not just go kill all your enemies and i would think Odin would actually be under that other that other camp where it's like let's let's project power softly just just to extend my slightly bad metaphor even further but but as far as how it's applicable today like personality wise i think thor just kind of he is a hero in the sense that he goes and defeats enemies but he doesn't it's it's not nuanced it's not uh in the sense of you, you know he he just goes and does it without regards to the consequences necessarily too so that's that's just something there yeah i'm i'm totally on board with that it it reminds me of the saying that uh when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly the thing there. And so, I mean, again, this is just this is just contrast, and this is it's contrast through you know their deeds. And I mean, we're we're about to get some deeds of Odin. So, yeah, let's shall move we? On. All right, back to the poem. Stanzas sixteen to eighteen. Greybeard said. I was with Fjolvar for five years on the island called Algron. We were waging war, killing warriors, proving ourselves, and sampling the local ladies. Thor said, How did the women treat you? Greybeard said, We had girls who liked to kick, but sometimes they would act docile. We had wise women, too, and sometimes they were loyal. Some of them wound some thread from a valley out of the sand. I made them all submit to my will. I slept with seven sisters, had all their charms to myself. What were you doing meanwhile, Thor? Well. I almost couldn't get through that without laughing. (laughs) (laughs) So, Odin gets rapey, <laughs> and uh, that's not funny. No, it, it's funny because we always have to have this conversation about the gods being rapey. Like, <laughs> I think the last few stories we've done, there's just like, like, come on, guys. It, uh, yeah. So, uh, girls who like to kick, I'm assuming it's because they didn't want, uh, you know, Odin sampling them. Although there there does seem to be some that 
were were into it. Not not the not the rapey part. Just they met Odin and willingly were like, "Yes, I will sleep with you." Um, yeah. So it's just I'm like, ugh. Yeah. No. No. I mean, this this whole thing. Okay. I I can get to a a, a few points here that maybe make the context a little better. So so I think he was he was of viking and i and i mean that in the proper term he was going a viking like that's the proper way to use the word not the way of us saying all of them were vikings no it's just the ones who were going viking who were vikings anyway they were they're going and and raiding on some island uh, all grun all green apparently so 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 a nice place they're going to a nice place and that's generally how it worked they would go to a place that was nicer than theirs and defeat the warriors sample the local ladies, and take stuff. And, I mean, that, that's pretty much exactly what's happening here. And there's some idea that the the practice of rape in wartime, and this is really, really to get, like, clinical and scientific about it. Scientific. Not really, because I'm not a scientist. We're not experts. That's just our obligatory... You, you know, we got to say that at least once every episode sort of thing. But but still, my <laughs> my best uh, crack at this is that it, it was something like it was developed because it was just the, uh, an easy way to spread your genetics. And this and this is some kind of thing that wouldn't have necessarily been like something understood consciously. I mean, this is just an idea of, you know, these warriors are out there getting their fight on full of testosterone sort of thing. And then there's kind of women around there it's it's an easy one-to-one natural conclusion of their hormonal urges sort of thing and we want to get all the way to clinical language sort of thing but then it it, it's also like it was a way of spreading your genetics into a new population and you're not necessarily going to see the benefits of that but it's it's a way for you as an organism to reproduce in a way that would not necessarily be accessible to you through usual social constructs. And so it was kind of an end around on the usual societal thing. And this is really just to say this is like we are competitive creatures and competitive for reproduction as well. And not all men were successful. This is a thing where on average over time, every woman who has a child has on average one child, something like that. And then every man who has a child has on average two children and the explanation for that is half the men had none half the men had no children but half the men were successful and had children but the ones who were successful ended up having more children and i know the numbers sort of don't make sense in your head but it's it's like kind of an over time thing if you were just to kind of kind of say that but uh either way that's the kind of clinical explanation the the best i've got as far as why first of all the vikings kind of had that reputation sort of thing because it was just a it was an opportunity to do this but i'm not saying that they understood that consciously it was just there are a bunch of men amped up on testosterone because they were just killing stuff and then there's some women and they go have sex which is i'm not condoning that i'm just saying that that's an explanation for that behavior for sure there's actually a a really interesting book called sperm wars that looks at I guess you call it like the biopolitical um, impact of the human male desire to spread their genetics. And they, they looked at rape during wartime. And because I think they specifically look at uh, World War II because uh, the Russians and the Nazis took turns going through each other's countries, raping everyone. And, and they... They suspected that basically what you're saying is that you're in this crazy situation where you could die tomorrow and you and with the the elevated levels of testosterone adrenaline and all that kind of stuff it's like okay i've killed i've competed w- with these people around me i've killed them and now i have to impregnate them to make sure that you know if i die tomorrow at least i've procreated and uh, passed my genes on at least once kind of thing, but. Or at least taking the shot, but. You know. At least taking the shot. Yeah. And it's, um, 
again, it's not, it, this is an explanation of it, not a, not a rationalization of it. Like it doesn't make it good. It's just that there's a difference, I guess, between noticing and condoning. And they're noticing that this is sort of the, what happens and suspecting that the behavior is caused by this. Right. And we're noticing it too. We're just noticing it. Yeah. Like we are not, uh, again, definitely not, uh, <laughs> even saying not condoning it, it's not strong enough for how we feel, you know, don't do this, but this is, this is more of an expl- explanation why it does occur in the world. You know, that these certain things, and then, you know, we're, we're absolutely not saying either that it has to happen. Like I'm sure not even, I'm, I'm sure it, there are people who don't do this as well, even in these similar circumstances, because they're able to sort of overcome their ur- the urge to do it. I'm, I'm sure the urge is there for most, but they're just not doing it because they're able to control themselves and have some, you know, sense of like self decency. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go for a super obscure example to illustrate that. Um, a German movie from the seventies, which is right in the middle of essentially a renaissance in, in German cinema, but they were really, really dealing with the legacy of, well, of, of world war two, the legacy of Nazism and, and all that. But the, the movie it's called Germany, pale mother, Deutschland, bleiche Mutter. And, uh, it's, it's the most depressing movie I've ever seen, first of all, but, you know, this this man and woman get together, they meet, the things are building up. Uh, I think he's uh, he's not a member of the Nazi party, and that's a, that's a big deal. Like, uh, it's a subplot that, you know, if he was a member of the Nazi party, maybe he doesn't get sent off to the front sort of thing. But they, they get together, blah, blah, blah. This guy gets sent off to the front. It's terrible. Uh, they are given condoms, semi-ironically for this whole sperm wars thing, but he, he doesn't even accept them. He's like, you use them. I'm not going to use them. He's, he's faithful and everything like that. And, uh, I mean, they cut it short to essentially his, his wife ends up getting raped by, I think it's actually American soldiers. Uh, and, and that's, that's very pointed, um, just to, it it was intentional, I believe, to show that the, the Nazis and the (laughs) Russian, the Nazis, the allies, the Russians, all of them were, we're doing not nice things and, and, uh, you know, their relationship falls apart and, and all that, but, uh, a a brutal movie, but, uh, yeah, this, this soldier is dedicated to his wife and I mean, bad things still happen to everyone, but he's, he's dedicated, doesn't go and spread his seed sort of thing. Again, the, (laughs) the, the condom thing kind of makes it funny how they would have been kind of passing those around, but I'm sure a lot of the time, Maybe you forget or you're out, but you've got an opportunity sort of thing. And Yeah, and it was probably uh, less about pregnancy and more about STDs and things like that, making sure it didn't spread amongst the, uh, the rank and file because that would, like that could wipe out your, your regiment kind of thing. And as I understand it, there was some consensual relations oh. between occupied peoples and, and soldiers and stuff like that. It, like, I mean, you know, the the idea of like uh, a big soldier sort of thing and, and maybe there's some rebelliousness going on there. But, uh, you, you know, it was common that there would be relationships and pregnancies that were completely consensual from wartime. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's funny. We One, we kind of see it even in like the, the Norse myths that, that there was, uh, you know, marriage between tribes for sure. Uh, and then, yeah, during, uh, during world war two in particular, well, maybe not in particular, just that's the records that we kind of know and have is that, yeah, there would be, uh, like, I know like German, German soldiers with French women were very common. And then at the end of the war, the, the French women were, punished by society for um for sort of offering you know comfort to the enemy but i'm fairly certain because you know it's easy to think of the two armies as these collectives right and it's just these monoliths but in reality like the people who were fighting they were individuals right so if if you were if you've occupied a town 
and you know you're you're mingling with the locals well you know what are the chances that you actually are going to enjoy the company of someone like probably pretty good because you know it's it's still people they're not they're not uh these bloodthirsty inhuman monsters most of the time like they're just you know these you know 16 to 18 year old boys who have been sent off to war and you it's know. 18 to 20. I thought it wasn't 16. Never mind. I'm, I'm well, not. no, just because I think a lot of them lied to get That's in as well. But, but yeah, no, it's sort of that, that prime age range, right? So it, they, these are actual human beings who are actually have actual personalities and, you know, so the idea that some of them might've found, you know, some of them attractive and want to spend time with them and, you know, get naked with them. Like, yeah, this, it's not uh, it's not as easy to think about because you, then you actually have to start thinking about them as individuals and everything. But you know, it does make sense, and you, yeah. So some of them were rapey. Oh yeah, totally. But and, others I mean, and, weren't like it. Well, exactly, and, and and I mean here, you know, Odin was rapey sometimes, but other times it 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 seems like I mean he he had wise women like that. That doesn't seem like it was like they were loyal. It, it, it's. Well, and, and that's a whole thing that I, I think we're possibly going to brush over here a little bit. It's like they, some of them wound some thread from a valley out of the sand, something like that. That's that's a very symbolic thing of like a, a woman weaving thread and fake. Like we, we've seen that before here. And, and honestly, that that's a sidetrack from this main thing. But it's like he's, well, Odin is almost archetypally sowing his seed in this situation and again to kind of come with the contrast here thor is talking about the these deeds of defense he's physical prowess something like that whereas odin is sleeping around and i mean you know there's there's a lot of negatives to that obviously but uh, i i think the the implication here is that he's he's going for the long game which is the game of having as many children as possible. And I mean, the, the, an actual direct example for those of you who watch, uh, if you watch Vikings, the TV show Vikings, they have Harbard as a character there basically doing exactly this. I am, well, no, like it, that this is the inspiration for that. Uh, this plus a couple of other situations where he just flirts with everyone and seduces everyone. And, gets a little bit rapey at least once. Like, uh, I think, he, yeah, uh, I'm not remembering if, if, uh, um, it, it like maybe with got Al- all the way to the end, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like with Aslog at some point, she was willing at some points, but then as it went on, she was unwilling. Something like that. Something like that. And I mean, that would fit the definition here, right? Uh, well, I mean, that definitely fits the definition. If, if there's, if there's not proper consent, you know, all the way through, right? That's exactly that's, that's what it is. That's so, what it is. That's right. But yeah. but no, this this is what Odin does and is willing to do, and he's willing to go through the violation of social norms, shall we say, in order to possibly secure the spreading of his seed as far as he can, which is certainly one uh, way of looking at someone. And I think I think most people would say that that's not great behavior being charitable to Odin in that case. But certainly the rapey bit, that's, that's, that's not great behavior. No. And I'm putting that very lightly. But uh, the, just even being a seducer is not great. No, and it, it's funny. Uh, in the in a Havamal episode that we'll be recording, you know, pretty soon to this one, they'll actually, Odin will actually say, don't seduce another man's uh, wife. And I wanted to look at this one a little more on the symbolic side uh, because it, I, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, different ways that you can actually interact with undifferentiated chaos and, and how it will interact with you. Sometimes you're going to try something and you're going to try and order it and it's going to fight back and kick back and you may or may not be able to uh, overpower it and you know, figure out what you're going to do with that chaos. Uh, sometimes it's going to work out really well for you. Other times, 
it's sort of going to go in a direction that you just didn't expect, you know, it, so sort of separating it from face value, I think we see, um, oh, and, and in this section, we also have him, uh, you know, killing warriors and, and engaging war. So you're, and that's sort of Thor's area, right? So we see him basically doing, engaging with undifferentiated chaos in every manner. Every manner is open to him. He can do anything. Whereas Thor seems very set with, well, no, I, I can, I can kind of destroy it or tame it or put it this way. But here we have Odin, you know, seducing, we have him, uh, raping, we have him sort of, we have him killing, we have him doing all these different things that just so that he can, uh, sort of gain the benefit of chaos. And so I, I'll talk about that symbolically and separate that from face value because it, you know, it, I don't want to talk about like how, how great it is that he can, you know, he can seduce you or he can rape you. Like, no, that's pretty terrible. So I laugh. It's terrible. I'm just, it's well, no, we get like, we're laughing at like, it's just so terrible. And like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Like it's just dark. And that's how you, one of the ways you can sort of diffuse the darkness and get through it is it, it's literally called gallows humor and you know odin is the god of gallows like it, yeah it, it it all it all works if, if you haven't picked up on it we, we are fans of odin generally prior to this poem and prior to the um part four of the Havamal where he talked about his relations with love which it all seems to kind of go in the same same thread but odin has his negatives and really seems to be a very much a, an ends justify the means kind of guy which is its own ethical question and and I think it's very much contrasted with Thor who is is very much a no he's going to do it his way and that's the only way we're going to consider it and there we go there's ends justified the means versus the the opposite of that I don't think there's a pithy way it means justify the ends or I suppose that's the only way to put it. But anyway, that's kind of the the accomplishments that Odin's talking about. And, and I like your point about how he, he does the things that Thor does too, but also all this other stuff. It's definitely a, a contrast. For sure. Shall we move on? I think it's time to move on, yeah. I, I don't know if we can get ourselves in any more trouble than we already have. <laughs> I agree, yep. This will be stanza 19. Back to the poem. Thor said, I killed Thiasi, the bold giant. I threw the eyes of that son of Alvaldi into the clear sky. Those are the greatest monuments to my deeds, which everyone can see ever since. What were you doing meanwhile, Greybeard? So it's interesting we have this... Uh motif of asking like what were you doing meanwhile it's sort of like i did this great thing what have you done and uh this is uh, thor relating the story of how he killed the giant uh, thiasi who had uh kidnapped a dune and obviously the apples were no longer available to the gods so they were starting to age and it was it was terrible but so this is actually a, i'd say a fairly significant accomplishment because he was able to to restore health and immortality to the gods by rescuing Idun and then uh, throwing the uh, the eyes of the sun Alvaldi into the sky, like he's saying, like I may, I put these stars in the sky, like and talks about it, that being the greatest monument. And yes, that is a pretty significant monument to his deeds. That there are now stars in the sky that he put there, uh, and it's it's another example of him. Uh, defending order and reordering things that have had been taken out of order um but it's it's still him doing the same thing he you know he killed theosi he uh he killed Hrungnir. like it, it's just thor doing the same type of thing over and over whereas we have odin being able to do oh, sort of a wide range of different things to interact with disorder and chaos yeah and, and and you know i think i think thor being proud of his accomplishments is directly in contrast with odin doing all of these things 
some of which are not great. Certainly not worthy of uh, having monuments to his accomplishments, shall we say. And, I mean, again, it just speaks to how Thor is doing these things that deserve these monuments. And, of course, Odin does some great things, too. He's not bragging about them, though. He's certainly bragging about those things that are, well, reflective of his character. That's, that's I think, specifically here. And, and I mean, this, this particular poem story is, I think it's, it's contrived directly to illustrate the contrast between these two. Just if we're, if we're speaking about kind of how this would have come about and the lesson that this would be imparting on the listener in general, I think it really is just to show that contrast. It's, it's certainly to, to say their deeds, but yeah. No, and the, the, the killing of Thiasi is a major one, a major moment, another story. Again, we've, we've gone over the, the bare details of it, but, uh, and I mean, Skadi joins the gods because of this. Uh, Thiasi is her, her father, and yeah, lots of big things come out of this. Thor is the one who was capable right? Thor was the one who was capable enough of defeating this giant. And I mean, I mean, that's, that's significant. The, the hero who is able to put chaos to order is generally the top of the, the pantheon. That's in contrast to, you know, the idea of the, the, the willfully blind father, this example of order that's kind of in decay versus this example of order that is fluid. It's interacting with chaos and putting it into order. This is most succinctly understood in the the Mesopotamian story of Marduk, but in here it's interesting. Odin is fairly clearly the head of the pantheon here, but he's not well loved. He's not you don't see tons of places named after him. He's Thor is the beloved one, and, and and Thor is the one who who undertakes these monumental accomplishments, and theoretically is one getting all the praise, all the monuments. I mean, there's a good reason why he is the one who is beloved. He's doing all these great things. But then there's Odin, and what Odin does to earn his place at the top of the pantheon is very different and maybe it's not necessarily obvious why Odin is the one who deserves it and 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 of course you can make the the claim that okay so Odin created the world from out of Umir and that was just enough to carry him through until he died you know hereditary um passing of the the title sort of thing but that wasn't the case with 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 Marduk it was the case where Marduk goes well it sort of is the <laughs> it sort of is the parallel to Marduk. It's more like uh, uh, it, it would actually be directly in parallel. Now that I think about it, Marduk gets to be the head of the pantheon because he creates the world out of Tiamat, which we've already said is sort of an analog to Umir. Both of them, at the, at the very minimum, the world gets made out of them by the hero, which is Odin in the Norse, right? But my point: so Odin gets to be the head of the pantheon. All right, great. My point is that Odin still does things that are worthy of kind of keeping him there. And, I, and that's, that's actually, that's an argument that I'm making. I'm not making that argument about the rapey stuff, but many of his other deeds are those things that are necessary to keep the society going with Thor as that opposition of, you know, that kind of stagnating one-dimensional aspect of order, which, which I think would, would morph into willful blindness, I think. Something like that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And something I want to mention is that when we're talking about these uh, stories, this is more of a, a, I guess, a meta point. You know, we talk about this is how we're trying to understand these stories as how the listener would have understood them back in the day. And we just want to make clear that they wouldn't have consciously understood the way these stories, the way that we are talking about them. Um, ideas like this, they, they go through um, sort of stages. And the, one of the stages to understand it is to tell stories and to have, have the gods act out, act, sort of act out these stories so that you can, uh, come to understand it. So the idea 
that I like to use and that I've, I've read is that you couldn't have had, you couldn't have had like Sigmund Freud or Carl Jung without Shakespeare because you needed someone to be able to piece these stories together in a, in a way that, you know, really made sense that everyone could relate to on a very general level. So the, I would say these symbols are like, we're able to see them and it. I would say it's connecting with us in a way that like, okay, yeah, this is, I recognize all this in the world around us. And when they were listening to these stories, you know, back then, they also, these stories would have survived because yeah, they, they recognized it. Uh, they were recognizing it in the world around them. They just didn't have the, you know, the, the hundreds of years of inquiry that, you know, Sigmund Freud had to like, be able to be like, Oh, this is exactly what that is. And yeah. So I, I just wanted to make that clear. Cause I, I, I'm definitely guilty of it where I, I have said like, Oh yeah, this is how they would have understood this symbol. And it's like, their understanding wouldn't be the sort of a scientific understanding that our culture now has. It would have been more like a, I guess like a folk understanding that, okay, this is, these are the things that are all wrapped up in it, but they don't, they didn't necessarily have the, uh, the individual nuances wrapped up in it because, you know, on the surface, we're talking about Odin and Thor just kind of insulting each other for a while. And then the story kind of peters out and ends spoiler alert, <laughs> But uh, there would have been this innate understanding of the story that, oh, yes, Odin is like this and he's, he's more chaotic and does things that aren't, that aren't good and that we couldn't have in society. And, and Thor, he's, he's the god of, you know, and he, friend of the common man and, you know, he, he does the right thing and makes sure that everything is ordered and he protects us and that's why we can eat breakfast in peace and that kind of thing. There, they wouldn't, there wouldn't have been the the in-depth like dissection of it, but there would have been that understanding and that deep uh, cultural fabric that they could pull from to know that this is how the world works and these stories work. Right. It, it, it's, it's an important distinction because the way we're going about this, and, and I mean, some of these things might be obvious to you because it's uh, some of what we're, we're going into is it's not necessarily like the most, um, you know, deep sort of understanding here like so, like some of these details are kind of on the face of it pretty obvious but we're going through it this way because we're wanting to really dig into it and get as much out of it as we possibly can and and the casual listener at the time wouldn't have necessarily done that so that's that's just why we're we're going so in depth into some of this stuff and the symbolism is is something we're just going to hammer at over and over and over again because it's it's important to understand what they are and it's important to know that there are examples and the examples continue and that really it paints the picture of the personalities of these gods which means it's painting the picture of what they represent symbolically and what their example implies if that's the example you want to live by which is certainly something that we we try to cover but um yeah the this one stanza we could go on and on about because this story is so significant the story of theosy but uh shall we move the story along yeah let's get back to odin behaving badly sounds good back to the poem graybeard said Great seductions. In the night I was ridden by women stolen from their husbands. I think Hyebarth was a strong giant. He gave me a magic wand, and I enchanted away his wits. Thor said, You repaid him badly for his good gift. Greybeard said, A tree has only the space it can crowd another out of. Every man must look out for himself. What were you doing meanwhile, Thor? Whew. So we have, again, we have Odin uh, seducing other man's wives. We've seen this in the uh, Havamal as well. So it, it's interesting that it's in two different stories. So this is like a running theme with Odin. This isn't uh, a one-off. It's... He he's known for this. Um, Hlebarth, the, the name means uh, protecting beard, 
and and they talk about him being a strong giant so obviously he was formidable i guess is a, a good way to think about it but uh odin was still able to uh seduce his wife away from him and and i would say this is uh this would be like very consensual because uh not to get too graphic but the, the woman is in the i guess position of power she has a control in this position um and i find it interesting that he they, he talks about uh he was given a magic wand and then enchanted away his wits so he was given this gift and then used it against against the person which i, I think is a uh it's a good warning that be careful of what you give to people or because when they could use it against you. So make sure you like, if you're going to give someone something very valuable or something very, uh, maybe I'd say close to the core of who you are, like you usually information, like make sure that they're trustworthy. Otherwise they, they'll use it against you and, and manipulate you the way that, uh, Odin here has manipulated, uh, protecting beard. Right. And, and again, it, it, it just shows that Odin is willing to do this stuff, right? He sees some benefit in doing that. Thor says, you repaid him badly for his good gift. Thor thinks this is wrong. And Odin obviously doesn't. Odin is willing to transgress social boundaries and norms in multiple ways in this stanza. I mean, the, our entire society is basically predicated on two things which one is essentially monogamy because that's how these social structures and family structures develop and on the other hand it's also that uh well you're not going to start feuds and break oaths and things like that it's 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 those two things it's the the bond of oaths between people at, with marriage being one of them, with monogamy being one of them, and he's willing to transgress both those things. And the the point, I think, really is that Odin is willing to do that if there's some benefit. And that's not fair necessarily to the to these people who he's he's doing this to. It, it very much isn't fair. He's he's saying that he's he's going to compete with whoever he's with really to get any benefit and. It it just it really really hammers home the idea that Odin is willing to do really the most despicable things. If 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 rape already wasn't bad enough, well, rape is probably like already worse than this stuff. But but still, so there's that. He kills. He rapes. He seduces married women, which it really isn't anything to say like the idea of a of a married woman necessarily being any different than another woman other than the fact that you know if if someone is is married they're theoretically bound by the entire they're bound and backed by the structures of society bound by on the one hand in the sense that you know for the most part most societies take oaths when marriage occurs certainly in western society that is the case i I'm sure there's some obscure example where this isn't the case, some tribe I don't know about. But for the most part, as I understand it, this is an integral part of marriage. And that's the binding part, where both parties agree that this is kind of like what's going to happen. But it's also backed by society. The entire structure of society is based on monogamy, at least in, in, in Western societies. And especially the, the Norse would have been, for the most part, I know that they're... They did stuff with concubines and and a few other things like that. And there's there's generally always exceptions with uh, with societies a uh, thousand plus years ago, especially for the most powerful people. But we'll call that an exception. I'm not trying to oversimplify, but I'm saying you know within Western society sort of thing, this is how it works. And so it's it's bound by and backed by society. And Odin is willing to transgress that in more than one way because seducing someone is one thing, but then also well, I don't know how else to put this, like how else to interpret this, like enchanting away someone's wits. Like that's like, at the very minimum, that's a, that's a direct betrayal of someone who has shown you good faith. It's breaking hospitality, the spirit of hospitality anyway. 
lots of bad things, oath breaking, transgressing society. It's well, <laughs> from an orderly perspective, from a perspective of order, that's not great. From a perspective of dabbling in chaos, maybe that's necessary. And that's the point. For sure. It, it's definitely. It's important that we uh, were able to sort of separate the, um, the value of dabbling with, with chaos from the face value of the story. Because in the story, the, the things that Odin is doing, the things that we're dealing with are they're really charged things. Because if they actually happen, they're pretty terrible and pretty destructive. So if you sort of abstract them, then maybe there's, that's where the learning can, and the sort of the discovering can happen because like, what do you, there isn't really anywhere to move with the, the raping or the, uh, stealing of wives. Like it's just bad. There's no, there's nothing there, but if you can, if you can sort of take it, okay, it's the story and then abstract it, then maybe there's something there. The, um, Something else that, that occurred to me while reading this was uh, what's called the uh, the price principle, and I'm I'm going to get the uh, the formula wrong because math is not my friend, but it, it's basically the idea that those who have the most are going to get more of it, and those who have the least are going to get less of it, and it's not it's not just in dealing with humans, but it, it's across basically everything. So the biggest stars get more planets because they're bigger and have more ability to gather more, like their gravitational pull is stronger so they can gather more things. Uh, trees in the forest, the, the biggest ones get the most light and so are able to grow bigger and they overshadow the smaller ones and those trees, you know, die off. Then they also are getting more nutrients from the soil and then it goes on like that. Um, if you have, if you have more money, you're going to be able to do more things that will get you more money and grow that money. Whereas if you don't have a lot of money, it's very hard to make that money grow. So it, it, it just, uh, it translates to basically every living thing that we know of that. And there is a mathematical formula and it's like, Oh, I'm trying to remember it, but it, the square root of something. Yeah, I think so. So it's the Pareto principle, I think what you're talking about, but the other one is Price's law, which is- Price's law, that's right, yeah. The square root of um, the number of people doing the thing do half the work. Isn't that right? The, like uh, if 10, yes. uh, no, no, that's that's a bad number. If nine people are, do, just because I know only the very simple square roots. Yeah. <laughs> if, if nine people are doing something, three of them are doing half the work. If- 25 people are doing something five of them are doing half the work that's the that's right that's price's law but i think Pareto principle is the well i think i think it's both that they the more people you have so the more trees you have there's like a very small amount that are getting like the most of everything because like with writing like i remember hearing some crazy stat that it's like stephen king and uh what's his name? That Patterson guy who does like they write virtually all of the books that are sold. Like if you look at it just in terms of sheer volume of books being sold, like they account for a ridiculous amount. And, and think of like your favorite authors that, that you love and that, you know, doing that do quite well and have made a living off of it. It's like, they don't compare to Stephen King or this Patterson guy, James Patterson. Uh, Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, because they just like it doesn't even come close to how much these guys sell. And every book that they produce just prints money, and they make tons of books. And yeah, exactly. Like it, it's re- like like they're they're the ones that are going to get the space in the airport bookshop because they're popular books that people just know by reputation of the author. This is going to be a good read for my flight, sort of thing. They're not going to give that space to some obscure author that's barely ever going to sell because they're going to get crowded out by the popular ones it's exactly. yeah that's yeah. that's just a very practical example of that at work yeah and so we have 
we actually have Odin kind of describing that, like, which I, one I think is kind of cool that he's able to describe that, but then it's also like, okay, he is, he is at the top of the, the hierarchy because he's willing to do all of these things. He's at the top of the hierarchy and he's also playing the hierarchy hard. Like he's playing the game of being at the top of the hierarchy hard and he's willing to do anything to stay there. And I mean, maybe you could see that as like kind of a, a corrupt power sort of thing. Like he's got all the power and he's corruptly doing what he can to get more. I like to think there's a better message here as far as what he's saying and it's it's sort of a, a double-edged thing here it's something like in order to get to the very top you probably have to do some of this nefarious things or or some things that maybe are a little unsavory and there's there's huge risk to that too like in Havamal section four episode four of the Havamal that we did there uh so 13 i think that was episode 13 well, Odin gets called an oath breaker. The, like he gets called out, he gets found out, he gets called out, and th- that is on his reputation forever. There's risk to operating like this. And I, and I think part of the Havamal, a good chunk of the Havamal is really saying, here are the bad things I've done and how not to do them. Like it's, it's not just Odin is this wise guy because he knows all the right things and lives it out. He actively transgresses his own wisdom whenever it gives him an opportunity to go further towards the top. For better or worse, right? So, I don't know. They, they, again, it's, it's a, a crazy little section there. I don't have much more for no, this No, I'm uh, I think we can move on. All right. Stanza 23. Back to the poem. Thor said, "I was in the east fighting giants, evil women who lived in the mountains. There would be many more giants if they had all survived. There would not be a single human left on Midgard. What were you doing meanwhile, Greybeard?" So, this one is interesting because he's uh, Thor. He's fighting evil women, which you don't often see, and he he makes the, I guess, very astute observation that if he hadn't killed all these women, there would be more giants. And uh, this is one of the most obviously contrasting statements that Thor makes to, to Odin because um, judging by what Odin has done previously, Odin would have slept with all of them. And maybe even all at once. I mean, he talks about sleeping with seven sisters like Odin's a wild and crazy cat. But uh, you, you see Thor dealing with sort of the, chaos and giants and all this kind of stuff doing what he what he does best and that's killing them there's no there's nothing else he's doing the same thing with the you know the evil giant women that he did with uh Thiasi, that he did with uh Hrungnir. there's no there's no nuance it's just okay this is a problem this is how i'm going to solve the problem and it, this solution works for every problem Whereas Odin, we've, we're seeing, is much more flexible on what he's going to do to benefit himself and climb the hierarchy. Yeah, and, and, and maybe, a, maybe a point there as well is that by benefiting himself and climbing the hierarchy, he theoretically makes it more possible for him to improve the situation for his family, for his society directly. Yeah, that is... I think the the right takeaway as far as Odin's character, but again, this is this contrast here, and and Thor comes across as very altruistic, and and this is why he's so beloved, I think, by humanity because he's theoretically this big protector. He's going off and killing the giants so that they won't kill all the humans. Like, why wouldn't you love him for that, right? And I mean, that's that's none of this is to say that what Thor is doing isn't good. What Thor is doing is absolutely good. And in fact, 
I think you would say it's good in in the truest sense. It's like he's he's being altruistic. He's he's going off to destroy this enemy for a good purpose. But if you're the enemy, if you're the giants, he's this evil character who comes and kills all your women, right? And and so I mean there's that there's that opposite there versus what Odin is doing. It's it's possible to interpret him as not the worst character. He gets run out of town on Vikings, like this harbor character gets run out of town on Vikings eventually because, you know, he crosses the wrong person, wears out his welcome, something like that. But for a while there, he's he's accepted quite well. And it's not to say that Vikings is is, is the source we should be using to interpret these myths. I'm just saying they they are pretty on the nose on this one as far as their applicability and basing their characters directly off of the mythology in this particular case. So I, I don't feel too uncomfortable using that example. No, I'd agree. I I do remember though uh, there is one point in the Vikings show where dealing with Harvard where I, I wanted to throw something at the TV because he talks about uh, taking the sins of the world on his back. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I still watched it, but it was, but, and I think it was so jarring because they had actually gotten the rest of it pretty right. I mean, they had this charismatic guy who told stories and seducing women. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of Odin. You know, that, like, they did a good job with that. And then they did the whole, like, Christian thing. I was like, that's not how they would have talked. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, and, and and certainly that's not in character no. for this version of Odin. But again, here's Thor fighting the good fight, killing the giants, saving Midgard. Good exactly. for Thor. And there does seem to be one of the big contrasts I'm seeing is that you know Odin isn't isn't just actually destroying the chaos. He's he's using it, or at least in the cases where he's. I guess, consensually sleeping with women. He's allowing it to, he's mingling with it. Like he's, the chaos still remains after, but he's still able to get the benefit from it. And I guess that's one of the questions that someone would have to ask themselves is, do you want to, do you want to order it? Or do you want to, um, to just mingle with it so that it can sort of enrich what you're doing? And I, I think uh, previously when we saw Odin fighting as well as seducing as well as raping, you're seeing him make those decisions where, okay, this is chaos that I absolutely have to order. So, for example, if you're setting up like a settlement, you absolutely are going to need to have like borders and your houses are going to have to have walls and roofs so that you're protected, right? But then there are other areas where you might you, you might actually be able to have chaos in there in the mix to make sure that it's uh you're not stagnating so i don't i don't know what it, well like you know free speech and free thought is one one of those ways that at least the west has decided like actually if we can keep that in the mix we're we're not too bad we we're going to get a lot of benefit from that yeah it, it, exactly it's 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 really thor being the the example of the, the, this very much order is going to stamp out the chaos and, and th these, these examples of order are exactly what he stands for. And here he is in action and he's in very stark contrast to Definitely. Odin. So shall we move on? Let's move on. Stanzas 24 and 25. Back to the poem. Greybeard said... I was in the south, making battles. I turned princes against one another. I never made peace. Odin receives the powerful men who fall in battle, and Thor receives the servants. Thor said, You deal out victory and defeat unfairly if you have so much power over battles. This is very interesting because it's referring to their respective halls and their basically the the classes in the society. So you have the the warrior class that uh, goes to Valhalla after death or to uh, Freya's uh, domain. I can't think of what it's called off the top of my head. 
Folkfang. Folkfang, yes. And with Thor, he get you know he gets their servants, but I don't think they're like personally servants to the warriors. They're the they're the farmers and the sort of the common man that Thor loves. You know, he, he's their protector. He he brings the rains to grow the crops that which all of this is going to be used to feed the warriors and that kind of thing. I think that's sort of what Odin is getting at in a in an insulting way. It's like, yeah, you're you're in charge of the servants to to my warriors. Well, I mean the reality is that especially back then you needed the majority of your people to to be growing crops and to ensuring that there was there was enough for everyone everyone to eat and you know that's why there was he had herring and goat at breakfast you know it's because thor had his you know had his people and was taking care of them just as and and they loved him for it and then thor says you know you deal out victory and defeat unfairly um we see that often in in the sagas actually where these people who had been favored by odin and were winning battles all of a sudden Odin decides, well, no, your time's up and you're going to lose now. And there's, there's a lot of lament to it. And it, you know, it's one of the reasons why Odin isn't loved is that you can't, you can't rely on him. Whereas with Thor, you can rely on him. He's, he's steadfast. And for the people, sort of what you put in to your, I don't know if worship is the, the right word, but to your honoring of Thor you felt like you'd get back, like there was a, a reciprocation. Whereas with Odin, there wasn't necessarily that reciprocal relationship. Right. He he would stand up for the common man. I, I think that's what this is really saying here. It's possible that this this whole story was, you know, something like common people trying to show how Thor is so much better than Odin with Odin's actual deeds as like kind of his, ex- the examples, right. Which is, you know, the, the best way to, to, uh, let someone condemn themselves is to just illustrate what they do. Right. But, um, you know, what Thor I think here is, is, uh, is saying though, is like Odin influences battle to get the, the best situation kind of for some vague long-term thing, not necessarily what would have been um, short-term, a a good result for a lot of people. Maybe, maybe it's an, an explanation of, you know, good warriors, good people falling in battle is like, well, Odin took them, the Valkyries or whoever took them. They were the best warriors and therefore they, they got taken out. Maybe this this was some kind of a way of explaining the grief and the 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 anger in dealing with that of losing a loved one who is theoretically some kind of a, a good warrior, right? And and I really see Thor as taking kind of the the approach of possibly the common man here, where it's like it's Odin has too much power. If this is what he's deciding, who gets to live, who gets to die, who gets to win who loses right and that would seem unfair to the people on the ground as this was happening or who were directly affected by it no absolutely i uh, i definitely see that and the yeah just again the contrast and maybe by the end of this we'll see that uh you know odin might be getting in the the best you know insults but Thor so far is coming off as a, as a better, uh, sort of as a, a better model of virtue so far. Definitely. Definitely. Shall we move on? Yes. Stands as 26 to 28. Back to the poem. Greybeard said, you have plenty of strength, Thor, but no courage. Like a prince of cowards, you got stepped on in a glove. You didn't look much like Thor then. You didn't dare sneeze or break wind for fear that the giant Fjallar might hear you. Thor said, Greybeard, you sissy, I'll kill you if I get across this fjord. Greybeard said, How are you going to get across? You have no transportation. What were you doing meanwhile, Thor? 
So we have Greybeard leveling a pretty big charge against Thor, saying, you know, he's got no courage, he's a coward. And those are uh, those would be killing words for sure. And Thor says as much as that, okay, like, you've gone too far, and now I'm going to have to come and, and kill you. I thought about this one for a while. Well, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the story they're referencing first. It's, um, I can't think of the name of it, but it's, it's sort of the, the famous, uh, story with, uh, Thor and Loki and they, they're going off having adventures and they come across a family and they, uh, have dinner with him. And then, uh, one of the kids, uh, eats some marrow out of the bone and out of the bone of one of the goats that uh, you Thor used to drive his, uh, wagon. And so to uh, pay back the, uh, the cost of the goat, they basically, they don't kidnap his son, but they, they take the son along with him on, on this grand adventure. And one part of the adventure is uh, dealing with this uh, giant Fjallar. And he's, he's like a giant giant. And so uh, they end up hiding in, uh, in his glove and they, like even Thor's like, oh geez, I don't think I can uh, take this guy down right away. So it's sort of the uh, and, and so they they hide and sort of use cunning rather than brute force to to get away. And so Odin's talking about how you know he was a a coward for doing this and all this kind of stuff. Where which is kind of funny coming from Odin because Odin has often used his cunning to get out of situations with giants and. So it, it, I, I would say this insult is sort of particularly stinging because Odin's being a bit of a hypocrite, which is super annoying. And then, of course, calling him a coward. I mean, Thor isn't going to stand for that. And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, thinking of it archetypally in that you have, you have Greybeard on, on the one side and he's basically saying, like, you don't, you haven't done what's necessary, or you don't have the courage to sort of mingle with chaos in the way that will get you to the other side. In a in an archetypal way, that if you want to get to this other side and cross the the unknown, then you're going to have to step outside of your comfort zone, and it's kind of like he's. I would actually say that this example is kind of an example of how he would step out of his comfort zone and that he didn't go and try and bash the giant's head in with his hammer. He used his cunning and his smarts to, to hide and then get, get by him. And it reminds me of the idea of that Carl Jung has that, you know, in the filth, he will find it. It's the, that place that you don't want to go. That's actually where you have to go to have the most growth. Well, you know, Thor definitely doesn't want to be a coward. He's willing to kill over it. But maybe that maybe if he acts out the coward, and I'm going to put air quotes around that word coward, that if he goes there, maybe he'll actually develop a new skill and, and be able to not just, you know, hammer giants in the head. Maybe he'll realize that, you know, discretion can be the better part of valor, that there are other ways to deal with things effectively. Right. And, and I mean, it, it's certainly not the only time where Thor uses his his wits. He's he's not as much as we're saying here in this story. He's kind of like a like a a, a one track guy. Like he only does the one thing. He he certainly is capable of stepping outside of his comfort zone. But it, it's it's obviously not his first reflex because of all of these examples of what he's doing. And I mean, Odin is is targeting his insults now where it's like this is directly the thing that's going to going to provoke him and maybe this is to illustrate again like he he provokes thor and it's like well how are you going to get across you have no transportation it, it in some weird way i think this this is illustrating how odin actually does have all the power over thor and maybe the positioning here of odin is is the one who holds the key to it at this point it it, it illustrates that Odin is actually kind of, he has earned the ability to have this transportation over this, uh, over this fjord, which again, symbolic of, uh, of that, 
undifferentiated chaos. But uh, no, it's it's um, again the the stories themselves are interesting, but it it continues to just show the the example of you know Thor is not necessarily worthy of getting what Odin has earned. Shall we move on? I think so. Stanza 29. Back to the poem. Thor said, I was in the east guarding a river when Sparang's sons attacked me. They threw stones at me, but they got little out of it. They ended up begging me for peace. What were you doing meanwhile, Greybeard? So then we have another example of, of Thor's battle prowess and, and actually like courage, you know, he's, he's guarding a river, uh, he's attacked and then is able to fend them off. So it, it literally is him, you know, guarding the border of the, of the known area and the unknown comes in to attack him and, and he's able to subdue it. So we've said it again, but that's actually like an impressive thing. Like the, the we haven't scoffed at it, but we we're not. Uh, as we're going through, we're talking about a lot of different things. But I think it is important to to emphasize, as you have been doing, that like Thor is doing a really good job here of making sure that the known is protected against the unknown, and there aren't these these incursions of undifferentiated chaos into, into the known land and that, you know, there isn't a destabilizing effect with it. So it's, uh, I guess a, a powerful response that he's trying to make to, uh, Odin who keeps asking like, well, what were you doing meanwhile? Exactly. And I mean, honestly, I don't have much more to this one other than he's, He's taking care of business yet again. Like he, he is this staunch protector. He subdues any invasion that would threaten the order that's developed. Again, if, if that's one dimensional, it's still it's a good one dimension. He's he's serving his purpose and he's serving it well. He's serving it nobly. He's defending. He's not he's not just going out and attacking. He's defending. He's He's uh, really making sure that the society that's built up around him is able to stay functioning. It's very noble. And, well, again, it's in contrast of all the things that Odin is doing, which seem to be not so noble. So, I don't have much more than that. No, I think we can move on because there's lots to talk about in the next one. Yeah. Back to the poem. Greybeard said, I was in the East together with a certain lovely someone. I enjoyed myself with that beauty for quite a while. I showed the blonde a good time, and she showed me one. Thor said, You had a good-looking woman there? Greybeard said, I could have used your help, Thor. You could have helped me hold that gorgeous girl down. Come on. (laughs) Okay, so uh, Odin getting rapey again. And it's funny because at, at first you're like, oh, you know, he showed this blonde a good time and she showed me one. That sounds pretty reciprocal, pretty, you know, pretty happy. Like that's how you're supposed to do it, you know? And then he's like, yeah, you could have helped me hold her down. It's like, no, that's not how you do that. So again, it's, Odin being rapey and now offering offering to Thor like hey you know you could have helped me like there's it's like he's trying to entice him into into doing this and to maybe maybe on a symbolic level maybe he's enticing him to interact with the unknown and chaos in the same way as like hey you could do this too you know and, and you know, I was with this really good-looking woman, and you know that's sort of how he gets to Thor. He's like, "Oh, well, good-looking woman, eh? Uh, okay, well, what do you have to say about that?" And then, yeah. Well, and uh, I think we might as well just yeah. Let's just keep going. 
So uh, stanza 33 to 36. Back to the poem. Thor said, I would have helped you if I had been there. Greybeard said, I would trust you about that if you hadn't tricked me before. Thor said, I'm no heel biter, no cheap old shoe in the springtime. Greybeard said, What were you doing meanwhile, Thor? Uh, so Thor uh, agrees that yes, you know what? I would have helped you uh, hold the girl down if I had been there. Which there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there, but it's interesting that the way he is going to help Odin out is still very much in line with how Thor deals with things. He's, he's going to take the, take, you know, the woman, the, the feminine and hold it down so that Odin can mingle with it, let's say in a non consensual way. And I mean, Thor will absolutely be a part and parcel of that. And, you know, it's him, you know, this is Thor's rapiness shining through as well. But uh, I I think it is, at least symbolically, an invitation to interact with chaos. And then when when Thor talks about it, he's, uh, he's still basically, he's still basically doing what Thor does but maybe in a, in a slightly different way that would yield a different result with the, the unknown and the, and the chaos. Uh, and then I'm actually not sure what uh, Odin is talking about when he says, you tricked me before, but then Thor says, I'm no heel biter or cheap old shoe in the springtime, which um, I just imagine a cheap old shoe in the springtime where you're going and it's, you know, the ground is, kind of hard but still there's like wet spots and you think your shoe's okay but then you you know step into a puddle and get a soaker and it's just terrible yeah that's where i went with that and you you know i think my interpretation of how kind of thor going along with this maybe this is something like maybe this is something how society builds up a tolerance for negative things in its midst, which which comes from people who are kind of orderly and kind of going along with it, kind of letting things happen, letting letting negative things happen, negative interactions with chaos, shall we say, just to keep it symbolic, letting them happen or even facilitating them happening because it's powerful people, influential people doing them who it's really easy to just go along with them rather than say, Hey, maybe, maybe not with that. And maybe it shows Thor's willingness. And maybe this is kind of like something symbolically like the, the willingness of society to not willingness, the susceptibility of society to, to be influenced by these negative people the, these negative actions, something like that. For sure. I, I'm actually, I'm thinking now of the, he's kind of being willfully blind here. And, and that is probably how, well, that is how things deteriorate in society is willful blindness on the part of, of many people. And also, and unfortunately that willful blindness is also what sort of gets the, the dramatic shifts and changes in society that, uh, that we see. And that I would, I would argue that Odin is kind of a, a symbol of it in terms of, um, like growth and, and development. You know, you, you, we see him go through dramatic changes frequently where, you know, offering his eye or hanging himself on the tree or even, you know, uh, Ragnarok, that kind of thing. So, and, you know, this is this is the type of action. If Thor had been there, like that kind of moral deterioration, that is, that's exactly the type of thing that kind of leads to Ragnarok down the road. Like it, it's that first step, but once you do it, then it, everything else becomes easier. It's a like a boulder rolling down a hill. Yeah, and and I mean, I, I, when you said if he had been there, maybe that's the key: is that Thor wouldn't be there. 
Thor doesn't get himself into these these situations, and maybe he's amiable and friendly and and perfectly fine to help out a friend in whatever their situation is, even if it's Odin being rapey. But it's it's also the case where he's not there doing that. He's and maybe that's another side of like kind of the blind eye. It's like you're not there to see what's going on, first of all, one. But on the other hand, maybe you're not so good. Maybe you're not so good that you wouldn't, if you were in the situation, that you wouldn't stand up and say no. Maybe it's that you're not so good that you would, that you wouldn't just let it go on or even help facilitate it. I mean, that's how the Nazis worked, essentially, was that ordinary people just went along with what was happening and even there were there were like um what it was the the brigades of people that essentially went went around shooting um well jewish people that they rounded up and all that and it was that they would all participate in these shootings because they didn't want their buddy to have to do that without them kind of shouldering the load so they kind of all stepped up and did these terrible things and you know maybe it's it's something like that he first of all he he wouldn't be there in the first place so on the one hand you could say he's being noble and being virtuous by not being in this negative situation but maybe it's maybe that's not the case maybe it's that he's not in this situation because he's ignoring it or or that he hasn't put himself into the right place to go there and and defend against these things going on but then he says well yeah i would have helped you out and it's maybe it's a sobering aspect of the i think an example of the the potential downside of too much order which I'm increasingly understanding the symbolism to be kind of going in that direction again, probably not intentionally on the part of the people who originally produced this poetry and were listening to it, but symbolically on that deep level, that's what it seems to be. For sure. And that's interesting what you said about, uh, like, you know, the regular people who were, you know, executing Jews, you know, in the Holocaust and whatever. Um, it makes me think like just going back in the, in this poem a bit, when, um, when Odin took advantage of, uh, Hlebarth's, uh, magic wand and it's, it's like he took advantage of this, of, of his strength and, and turned it into this incredible weakness that, you know, he had this magic wand and he was hospitable and let, you know, gave it to Odin as I'm assuming a sign of hospitality and Odin was able to turn it against him. And it's like in the case of these, I mean, there's a book called ordinary people about this exact thing. These ordinary people who grew up in a very ordered society, who, who were very respectful of hierarchy it was used against them to, to carry these things out. And I can definitely see, like we're seeing how Odin would use that against Thor that, well, you know, I was with this, with this woman and like, Hey, you could have, you could have helped, you could have helped order this if you had been there. And Thor was like, Oh yeah, yeah, I totally could have. I, I absolutely could have uh, helped order this. You're right. Like that's what I do. And you're just like, well, crap, like that's, that is what you do, but the context matters. The context matters and Odin comes off as much more sinister. Oh, much more sinister. Like, no, even like, yeah, he's rapey, but here he's like so manipulative and he is, he's got so many negative qualities that it's very, very hard to see the good ones shining through. And it's, and it's certainly in other stories and other moments where that happens, but Oh man, right here. And wow. And it's his son. Like, let's not forget that too. Like, let's just throw that in there. Like this is Thor is his son and he's going to manipulate him into doing these terrible things. Yeah. And I mean, maybe the, maybe the idea there is he really is. He's just trying to get, Thor 
more able to handle the chaos around him, the the unknown in, in a more nuanced manner, and maybe he's trying to just bring that out of him, but... Ugh. Well, if we go to the Voluspa and remember what happens at Ragnarok, where Thor kills the world serpent, they both die after because you need that. You need both the the chaos and the order to for both to exist actually. And so this might be an attempt by Odin to almost get him more onto the, into the gray and his gray beard. Anyway, that, I, I don't think actually that was, that's a thing, but it just struck me that, that, you know, that's an interesting, but get him because Thor is pretty black and white. And I think that's what we're seeing where Odin is, just gray. There's no, there is no dike. Like, yeah, it's just all sorts of context and, you know, maybe this or that, but you, yeah. So it, I wonder if this is sort of the attempt to like get Thor into an area where he isn't going to kill, like he wouldn't kill the world serpent. It, he wouldn't fall into too much order. He would re- recognize that you actually need the chaos to come in. Right. Sure. No, no. And, and actually that, (laughs) that makes total sense. And it's, it's almost noble if you think about it that way, because, you know, Odin knows the fate of the world now, supposedly, at least if we're using some tenuous causality where he would have, yeah, we, we don't know the order of these stories anyway, but well, yeah, Odin dies and Thor dies too, and maybe he's trying to make something work where Thor isn't necessarily going to die. So maybe Odin's just being a good dad. Well, we've you've said we've said that in this very episode that Odin is an ends justifies the means, and I think like ex- that's exactly what we're seeing. And then. No, I don't want to ask that question. <laughs> well, it's it's a it's a if it's anything, it's like kind of a, a tough love approach to, for sure, elicit growth, shall we say? Yeah, I think I think we could look at it like that. I mean, at least at least symbolically, I, we could. Again, the, the rapey stuff. It all, it's always that thing where you, like, it's just so bad you can't discount it. But there are. But there is value like around it, and it's like okay, well, if if you kind of like on the face value, it, it's like yes, rape is bad. But there are there are things here. Rape is bad, but there's things here that you can learn from. But remember, rape is bad. Like it, it it's just it, it's very difficult to uh, to do this without like. Even just like sitting here, like feeling a little slimy, like, like it's just, I don't know, I think that's one of the reasons, like another reason why we're laughing is it's uncomfortable because, you know, we're, we have this goal of getting these, looking into these stories and to get any value and just be, not just throw it away and be like, no, this is garbage. It's like, okay, well, we're going to have to look at these terrible things and try and tease out something of value here. Yeah, exactly. That's the only way we're going to get out of this with any sort of ability to feel good about ourselves yeah, after exactly. this. Is if we, is if we, is if we get to the deeper meaning underlying these stories. So, anyway, shall we move on? Yes. Stanzas thirty-seven through thirty-nine. Back to the poem. Thor said. Fighting berserkers' brides on the Isle of Hlaise. They had done evil things, assaulted everyone. Greybeard said, How shameful of you, Thor, fighting women. Thor said, They were wolves, hardly women. They broke my ship when I landed ashore, threatened me with iron rods and chafed my servant Thjalfi. What were you doing meanwhile, Greybeard? Jeez, the nerve of Odin, like... You know, how shameful of you, Thor, fighting women. And this actually begs the question, maybe... 
Well, no, like, I was going to ask, was rape considered something awful back then? or what? But if I remember reading in, in Tacitus and Germania, yes, it was. They were, a, you know, they were considered a chaste people who, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't have sex outside of, outside of marriage in that, like, if, if you were married, you didn't have sex with anyone else other than your wife. There'd be thralls as well. But I guess people, let's say, of equal standing, you didn't have sex with someone else's wife. Like, that was punishable. And I remember reading punishable very quickly. Like, it was dealt with quickly and you usually ended up in death. And so there is a sense that there is a sense of like sexual impropriety and like, you know, raping someone. And I guess it would be. You wouldn't, you wouldn't rape someone in your own tribe because they were of your people and probably had some inherent value. Like they were inherently valuable to you because they were your people. Right. Whereas outside the tribe, then I can kind of see it. And I, I actually just looking back now, Greybeard's stories, mostly he doesn't talk necessarily about raping people in his tribe. It's like usually enemies or. I don't think, I don't know if that's like a silver lining or anything, but it's just that you could see how if you didn't put any value on the people outside of your tribe, then this isn't like, who cares if you do it, right? Like, and I, and I do think there was that, that sense that there was in your tribe and then there was outside your tribe and those were not equal. And so there were, there were allowance, there were like rights and privileges you'd give people in your tribe that you wouldn't give outside of your tribe. Um, so maybe that's, that's why the rapey stuff is there. I don't know that it's a theory. I'm sure there's uh, I w- actually wish uh, professor Larrington was here because I'm sure she'd have amazing insight and books for us to read. I'm like, Oh, this is how that works. It's like, okay, perfect. But uh, agreed. It was a very good interview. Do you, you had to check it out if you haven't. Definitely. But uh, I just, on the face of it, you know, that Odin would say, oh, how shameful of you for fighting women. It's just, it's aggravating. Like maybe, and maybe that's just what it is. Maybe he's just like twisting the blade in Thor's side just a bit, just to get a rise out of him because like he's been doing all these terrible things women Odin has. And then we have ones where at least like he's fighting. It makes it, at least it sounds like a more of a fair fight as fair as it can be with Thor. And it was like, oh, that's shameful. And you're like, come on. Oh, definitely. And, and, and I mean, Thor, he justifies what he's doing as well here because I think he probably feels the need to justify what he was doing because, again, there's that sense of honorableness. And I mean, maybe a, a dishonorable person would be like, yeah, of course I was fighting women. What the heck do you, th- like, you know, he like he, he wouldn't justify it. You you would be like, well, like, what? What's the problem, right? Yeah. Like, that's that's the other that's the other side of it. So Thor is again being honorable here. What I find interesting about this story. So first of all, uh, Hlese in, I'm definitely not saying that right in, in here is, um, is apparently it's a real Island in, in Denmark, Lassa, which, uh, which is, uh, an Island, uh, kind of off the Northern coast of Denmark sort of thing. And, and that's just interesting because we, we get these real world, places involved in stories with the gods which is kind of funny like again the the story that uh dr larrington talked about with the, this eternal battle until ragnarok uh again listen to the interview if, if you haven't it was, it was very good and she'll go into the story in more detail but it takes place on a real island in orkney hoy in in orkney and i just i just find that interesting again it, it just it means that the gods are a literal part of the literal world as far as the, these people see it. And so that's just cool. But what's interesting here, though, is I've read that this is a possible allegory for waves. He's actually fighting waves. And what's funny here, so first of all, they're female because the ocean is the pre-cosmogonic, undifferentiated chaos. I'll keep using pre-cosmogonic, but, you know. and no, perfect. Yeah. And the, but... And so it's symbolically feminine. And then there's these waves lashing against his, his boat and, you know, bringing him ashore. And here's where it gets to 
maybe the futility of, of Thor's one way approach because you can't fight waves, but Thor's only got one tool in his toolbox. And it's like, oh, these waves are being so, they're just destroying my boat. They're, they're bashing up against the rocks. They're being so dangerous. We'd better put them into order. I'm going to go fight the waves. And that's not going to work. No, no, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't work at all. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't realize that, but of course, yeah. And, and he's basically like describing, describing waves and berserker. Like that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love yeah. It. So it isn't isn't that crazy though? It's like Thor will go so far on his yeah. his his one track that you know when he's when he's dealt with all the chaos and all the other ways up. Time to go fight the waves. Yeah, <laughs> and and he thinks he can. Like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put order to these waves. You know, they're gonna they're gonna shape up and like listen to what's good for him. And like even today, like the closest I think that we get would be like uh, using waves to power um, like hydroelectricity. Like that's the close. So we're not even like controlling them. We're just figuring out how to harness it and and work with it. But we can't. We can't control it. Like that's, yeah, that's crazy. Well, and just emblematic of Thor's personality again, Absolutely. right? It's it's really interesting how this whole poem has has put into sharp relief Thor's positives and Thor's negatives, and this poem has also put into sharp relief lots of Odin's negatives. Yeah, there's not really many positives coming through. For, no, uh, we're we're really having to dig for for the the positives or more like. Not justify. We're not justifying Odin's actions, but we're at least saying, like, kind of based on the other stories we've looked at and how his character is. At the very minimum, the the best we can say about him is that he's ends justify the means, and he's and he's he's doing these things for some benefit. Just you know, the things that he's doing are pretty despicable. So anyway, Thor's lots of positives with Thor, but also like he'll go and he'll go and fight the waves. That's that's not. That's not a useful application of order. That's not a useful application of society. You know, it's like, maybe it's something like when when society and when order gets too far, it's like, it, well, actually, yeah, it's like it's going to order every single thing up in, in the world. And, and you just can't. You just can't. It's it, but, it, but it's going to try if it's left unchecked, which maybe is the counterbalance with Odin here. Yeah, that might be it. And and you're right. Like when order goes too far, it is trying to order absolutely everything. So and so we have the I'm just watching Thor smash waves with his hammer and being like, why isn't this working? It's pretty humorous, yeah. right? <laughs> if you think of it like that, yeah. And it, but it makes perfect sense too, which is almost funnier. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Shall we move on? Let's move on. Stanzas forty to forty two. Greybeard said, I was with an army. We came this way to wave some war banners and get some spears bloody. Thor said, Now you're saying you came to do the gods evil? Greybeard said, I'll give you this arm ring to make up for it. Fair judges would say it's an equal value. So we have Odin doing uh, Odin things where he comes with his war banners and uh, spears that he wants to get bloody, which like that is uh, that imagery is very Odinic just in that when he's, he's a God of war, but we've, there are other warriors like there's Tyr, there's uh, Thor even, you know, but uh, the idea of bloody spears and war banners, that's very much uh, emblematic of Odin. Um, Odin, of course, has his own spear, Gugnir. Yeah. And uh, so when there's references to that, you know, like this is like, this is Odin, you know, there's no, no doubt about that. And, uh, and so waging war, and we just talked about, you know, Thor accusing Odin of not being fair in, in his dealings with war. 
because he picks different uh, different victors and maybe the army that is the best one isn't the one that wins through some misfortune, that kind of thing. And that I think that's why we're seeing Thor accuse him of doing the gods evil and that it's uh, w- battles and war are unpredictable. And then we've also seen in other wars uh, the gods doing things that were, uh, you know, through deceit and lying where Thor gets very upset. So I think you see Thor like getting upset with that and being like, Oh, so you, you are doing that. You're doing the gods evil now and all this kind of stuff. And then Odin, I would say very, uh, almost probably mockingly says, Oh, I'll give you this arm ring to make up for it. You know, it's like, Oh yeah, we're doing these terrible things, but here have some, have some gold. And, uh, you know, fair judges would say it's an equal value. So he's he's not putting any price on, like on on fairness. And it, the arm ring that he's referring to is uh, Draupnir, and it would be. I took this to mean that, he, uh, this would be he would give him one of the rings that uh, Draupnir produces every. I think it's nine nights. It produces another nine rings, but, I mean, the the rings that get produced don't produce anything more. They're just there. And so this is really like no sort of sacrifice or hardship or really anything. It's kind of not, not worth anything from Odin because he, he can make it whenever he wants. And uh, he's saying like, oh yeah, like here, have this trinket that, you know, it might be worth a lot of money, but to me it's it means nothing. It's, uh, I get these things ever, like all the time. So, you know, have it. It's almost a, a funny parallel to the uh, the breakfast that Thor offered at the beginning. That it it's not really of it's a value to someone who's hungry, but to Thor, it's like well, it's just you know a normal everyday thing. So yeah, and and the other side of it too is that I think Odin must see this as like he no matter what evil he does, he can always he can always just pay for it and and get out of it and that's just going to be that he's not going to get any consequences out of it and i mean someone who's who's thinking honorably like thor is wouldn't stand for that and there there certainly was a concept that you would pay for crimes like that was that was something that was done here but i mean to a certain extent certainly you can do that today as far as you know fines and things like that but you you do something significant enough you are going to go to prison regardless of you know what you think about the the criminal justice system and whether there's some imbalances towards people who have wealth like odin obviously does but you know there's also very high profile cases of people committing murder or rape or whatever and and actually you know going down even even though it it might look like it's kind of stacked against them sort of thing but this is just sort of i think that same attitude where it's like well, have an arm ring. What? What? Like, what's the problem? Now you're rich. Like, <laughs> it's it's an attitude, and it's uh, and I, and I think, I think it, uh, it. First of all, it illustrates Odin's power as well, because it's like, yeah, he is actually at the top of the dominance hierarchy. He's he's got this arm ring that produces more arm rings, and he can just throw out. Well, throw one away as uh, as penance for whatever evil he does, and I mean it's it's just something that I think it's an attitude. It's it's like no matter what happens, first of all, Odin is doing these things for some greater benefit down the line. But also, if he gets caught by that, he doesn't have to worry about that because he'll just pay them off, something like that. Yeah, I definitely definitely agree with that. That. Sir, no matter what happens, Odin, Odin knows that he can pay the price, and in some ways, that's a, like, like when he's searching for wisdom, and pays the the eye for for that. It's like that's impressive. Here, it's less impressive because it's like, yeah, here, have this. I I can pay it. Of course, I can. This one's easy, and kind of it, it's a jerky thing, right? Like, yeah. Oh, exactly, and and I mean. End of the day, well, I mean, Thor isn't isn't gonna like this, and shall we yes, continue? Let's continue. Stanzas forty three to forty six. Back to the poem. Thor said, "Where did you learn to spit out all these hateful words? 
I know I've never heard more awful talk, Greybeard said. I learned this sort of talk from the old men who lives who live in the forests of home. Thor said, You give a good name to burial mounds if you call them the forests of home. Greybeard said, That's how I talk about such things. So this is interesting because it it sheds some light on, uh, like, I think, cultural, uh, I guess, taboos. So we have... We have uh, Thor getting quite upset with the, the words that Odin's using. And, and Odin's, you know, he's being a jerk. And uh, Thor is unhappy with that. So it's like, you know, where did you learn to talk like that? Like, you know, did, did your mother teach you that language? No, it doesn't say that, but that's sort of the... You hear that all the time, especially with kids who are trying to be smart. You know, one kid swears at him. He's like, oh, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? That kind of thing. But uh, you see, uh, I think you see Thor give a pretty good, uh, you know, jab at uh, at Odin here because he says, you know, you give a good name to burial mounds if you call them the force of home, meaning that Odin is hanging around burial mounds. And there are, uh, there's a lot of um, taboos, I would say, around hanging out, like around, you know, places where you put the dead like there there are certain ceremonies where you would go there to you know to honor the dead like funerals and then uh places to um other festivals that would might honor it i i know i i've heard like during yule there might be something with ancestors where you'd go to the burial mounds and that kind of thing but uh but otherwise you generally don't hang around burial mounds because it's it's not it's not a place for the living and you, you see this throughout cultures like throughout the world like you don't if you're hanging out in a graveyard there's well even now it's kind of like it's weird like you don't there's not necessarily the um the intense taboo around it now but it's still like if you hear about someone who's you know oh I'm just going to go for a walk in the graveyard it's kind of like well that's that's odd that's not not quite right uh one of the one of the like the really uh, great examples of this that that we've seen and it it's found in the in India and in the I guess the Hindu culture. Um, I'm going to try and get this the word right, but it's the um, the Aigu of Shaiva Sadhus, and it's this religious sect that believe that if they basically break all the rules they will attain enlightenment and and break the uh the cycle of reincarnation and and birth and death and that kind of thing and so they uh they hang out in uh in graveyards and, and in india they do a lot more uh, cremation and funeral pyre so they will uh, be like they'll be around the, the cremation pits where it's just like, and they'll roll themselves in the ashes of dead people and cover themselves. And they do all sorts of things that go against the, not only are taboo, but also are like anti-life. So, uh, they will, uh, they're cannibals. They will also, uh, you know, eat and drink, uh, you know, urine and feces. And it's, it's all in this, attempt to uh you know break free of of life and and to break the cycle of uh you know reincarnation but they're also like they're shunned by society they're they're considered like just to be absolute madmen and the rest of society has not only has like a, a taboo about being around the burial mounds, but also about being around these people who spend time in the burial mounds. So there is a long standing tradition of in multiple cultures of not hanging around burial mounds outside of these prescribed sort of holy times where like funerals or uh, days where you honor the dead and that kind of thing. Yeah. I hadn't heard of these folks, but I think there was also a sect of Buddhism that did something similar. I, it might be just tantric Buddhism in general is um, 
there there's definitely uh a type of buddhism that that did this stuff like breaking taboos and 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 things probably not sure. maybe not i don't know about the specifics uh the the graveyards and stuff but bodily fluids was what what got me onto that it, that was definitely like a thing that they sure. that they played with and and you know we have the this idea that tantra or whatever is like this this sex thing and, and that's only one part of it and yeah it's a whole it's a whole deal and theoretically, it's something like you can overshoot your enlightenment, something like that. Like if you go too far oh, into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is really, that's me poorly remembering a um, course I took on on Buddhism a few years back. But anyway, um, what's funny is that, well, we have, and I think I've talked about this before, is that we have some evidence of, you know, the burial mounds and things like that actually being kind of lived in sort of thing as in people would go there in specifically areas that uh, made these me- um gigantic stone burial places but i could see it being possible where it's like it's it looks lived in archaeologically whatever because they only went there on like sort of on holy days something like that so i mean certainly i'll leave that open but at at a minimum, it was like you would still kind of go and interact with your dead, with your ancestors, and and kind of, well, whatever they did, it was it was sort of. You would visit the dead at the at the very minimum and visit these places there, and and I mean being comfortable with that. It I think that says something to. Odin in this case is, really looking at his ancestors and looking at maybe what came before him, and and maybe he's saying something like what I'm doing is what my ancestors did in order to ensure the survival of the tribe. Maybe that's what he's implying. Interesting. And that makes a lot of sense because there are, um, I mean, he does practice uh, necromancy where he speaks with the dead. And in fact, the, uh, there are, there's debate whether or not the CRS and the Voluspa is the, you know, the dead witch that he, resurrects to to get the sort of the secrets of uh ragnarok about so yeah like he definitely this isn't a one a baseless charge but also um it would show odin being like yeah well i had to do that in order to find out what's going on yeah he admits it freely this is how i talk about such things it's not like it's not like he's hiding away from that he's like where did i learn this well you're talking to the dead. Yeah. Which for us, I think, it points to something like looking at the stories of your ancestors and, and your ancestors directly and, and learning whatever lessons kind of are there. That's not to say that'll make you rapey. No. <laughs> that's, no. That, that's not the goal, but, but, but Odin certainly has other good, um, good parts that... Uh, shine through again if you, if you look past all that but anyway we've we've already covered the rape is bad part fairly, i think so yeah fairly extensively so shall we move on let's move on stanza 47 thor said i'll repay you for this slander with a good beating if i can get across this fjord i think you'd howl louder than a wolf if you felt my hammer on you so it's thor again solving his problem with a with a hammer and and physical violence it's and pretty straightforward it's pretty yeah. straightforward yeah i think I, he's uh he's uh gotten nicely wound up by now yeah i think he's ready to yeah he's ready to to pop he's ready to fight so i don't have no and i think actually like if you think he's ready to fight now just like wait for the next one so let's get into it okay back to the poem 48 to 50 Greybeard said, Your wife has a lover, Thor. You'll meet him as you go home. Then you'll really suffer. That one's a better target for your hammer. Thor said, You are just lying at random, saying whatever will most anger me. You cowardly fool. I think you're lying. Greybeard said, I think I'm telling the truth. But you're late completing your journey. You won't get home for a long time, and even if you walk all day and night. So, the proper response to a big angry man who 
already wants to kill you is to then accuse his wife of being unfaithful to him. That I, I guess it takes some guts or something. I don't know if guts are the right word, but just like just when you think Odin can't, there aren't any more lines for Odin to cross. He's just like, oh, and your wife's a whore too, <laughs> and it's like, well, come on. <laughs> I. There are a few instances where uh, Sif is accused of being unfaithful to Thor, Sif being Thor's wife. And there's debate whether or not she was actually unfaithful. I tend to think she she was faithful. Uh, one, just because the um, in other stories and other instances, I guess, she's held up in a very positive light as an example of, of being a wife and sort of how you, how you're supposed to act as one. And the, as well, I think the, the story that they're referring to and where, you know, she might've been unfaithful is where, uh, uh, Loki like shaved off her hair while she was sleeping. And, the implication that Loki makes is, well, you know, if I was able to get that close to your wife while she was sleeping, like who else could have? So I, that's why I, I take it with a, a big grain of salt. And, and he uses that to, uh, to bother Thor because his wife is bald now. And then Thor threatens to, I think, break every bone in, in Loki's body. If he doesn't, you know, solve this. And so Loki goes to the dwarves and they make her, uh, a wig of like, hair spun out of gold and he also that's also when he gets um mjolnir and uh gungnir and, and other uh treasures from from the dwarves but so that's why i think i that's why i don't think sif is unfaithful i think i think this is just just one of the lies that everyone kind of knows is isn't a truth and uh odin's just using it to to bother him yeah, it's it's about the, the the worst you can get. I mean, he's he's calling him a cuckold, and that's yeah. like it, it's that's directly what he's doing. And I mean, I I feel like there's if there's anything in there, it's something like he's away from home and he'd better get back there, or something like that. Like this whole section seems to be like, well, you're late, so therefore you're late getting home. And I mean, you, you better get home because your wife might be with another man sort of thing. And I, I like, I, I don't get a lot out of this other than maybe like, may, maybe Odin is, is kind of saying, wrap this up. I'm trying to, I think I've been trying to think through what symbolically this could kind of, kind of get to maybe something like value your loved ones and, and don't always be away, maybe something like that. I think I'm really reaching here though. I think this is just Odin being the worst. It could also be maybe the idea an idea of if if you're not there to like I don't know embrace the mother of invention, it'll go somewhere else and then you're going to be you're going to be behind the behind the curve as it were so maybe that's it but again like i don't know let's go with that okay that's 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 pretty good that's that's better than what i could come up with fair enough so we'll move on let's move on all right uh this will be stands as uh 51 to 53 back to the poem thor said graybeard you sissy You're the one who's held me up, Greybeard said. I didn't think that Thor would let some peasant hold him up on his journey. Thor said, here's some advice. Row that boat over to me. We'll stop this bickering and you'll meet me face to face. So now we're like, well, I think when the story is kind of winding, about to wind up and... Thor is looking for that face-to-face confrontation that uh, that will allow him to take this chaotic ferryman and uh, put him in order and and really straighten him out and get him to uh, take him across the fjord. 
yeah, it's he wants a resolution. I think we all want a resolution. And I, I mean, again, here I, I think the story for a while now has been just going towards its its conclusion here. And I I think we're pretty well out of the meaning of the story. We've 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 kind of gotten to that. So, or can we move on? Yes. <laughs> Back to the poem, fifty four to fifty seven. Graybeard said, "Get far away from here. You don't need to ride the ferry." Thor said, "Then show me the way around if you won't take me across." Greybeard said, I won't deny that request. It's a long walk. Go to the tree trunk, then to the rock, then turn left till you reach Midgard. There your mother, the earth, will meet you, and she'll show you the god's road to Asgard. Thor said, Can I get there today? So, I'm wondering if the directions that uh, Odin gives Thor are actually like good directions or if it's just like, yeah, go because it'd be like a forested area. Right. So like go to the tree trunk. Well, which tree trunk? Oh, and then the rock. And you're like, well, yeah, there's rocks everywhere. Uh, And then your mother, the earth. Well, she's all around. So, yeah, I think he's just. uh I think he actually might be giving him the runaround, but Thor isn't, I guess, maybe clever enough to see that. Maybe. I mean, what's funny here is, is like, okay, so Thor says, show me the way around or you won't take me across. So I think maybe this gets to something like what we've been talking about here. Like, he wants to see a way around the unknown, which maybe if we've learned anything here is that you do need to interact with it and and use it and and Odin won't just take him across I suppose if anything here maybe he's trying to get Thor to figure out how to get his way across on his own and that's a part of that growth sort of thing like he can't be the one to facilitate Thor making it across and then when he says well show me the way around it's also like show your own way around like come on what have you have you been listening like what and uh and Thor is naively like, can I get there today? And it's like, well, mm. if there's anything to take away from this whole section, I think it's that Odin is still being an asshole, but he's at least kind of saying, like he's trying to facilitate Thor yeah. figuring things out on his own, which maybe is kind of the noble thing that a parent should do. That's all I got. No, I, uh, I could buy that. I mean, I, I, we are definitely open to other opinions and uh, interpretations for sure. So, like, get in touch with us through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or email. Like, absolutely. But uh, that's sort of, yeah, I think, I think that's a good way to sort of sum it up because, yeah, other than that, I just have Odin being a jerk for no real reason. And it's like, well... <laughs> Should we wrap this up? Yeah, let's wrap this up. This will take us to the end, 58 through 60. Back to the poem. Greybeard said, I suspect if you travel hard, you could be there before sundown. Thor said, I see this conversation is over since you only answer with insults. I will pay you back for this delay if we ever meet again. Greybeard said, Go now. And have a bad journey. So even at the end, he's just like, you know, go and have a bad journey. That's that's not a very nice thing to like. It definitely breaks the rules of hospitality. Like there's, yeah, just being a jerk. And it, but I could see how Thor would have a bad journey. If, if he's trying to go around chaos, if he's trying to order everything, and if he's not able to sort of roll with the punches, as it were, that, yeah, you're going to have a bad time if you're always trying to trying to put things in their neat little box and if you're not willing to kind of roll with it. Yeah, if there's anything I'm going to take away from this entire thing, if it's relating to not just the contrast of Odin and Thor, it's, it's something like... Odin is trying to get Thor to open up to the idea of 
crossing through the unknown. I don't want to say the easy way. You need to have a ferry. You need to you need to know how to do it. You need to yeah, you need to know how to do it and that's not trivial. But then once you figure it out, you you've got it. Then you can make this journey. And maybe that really is just to put into sharp relief. Odin can make these journeys because he's willing to do whatever he needs to do to traverse the unknown, to traverse chaos. And Thor isn't willing to do that. He just hits stuff with his hammer. And maybe that is to put the moral lesson that neither of these guys is Odin and Thor. Neither of them is perfect. They both have strong negatives. Odin has much, much stronger negatives, at least in this story. But Thor also has his his points. Like he he tries to beat down the waves. If we're accepting that, and I think I think that stands actually fits pretty well on that. So it's Thor tries to order things too much. Doesn't embrace chaos enough. I think is something that we're look like at least seeing here. And Odin maybe embraces chaos too much and he is a jerk and a rapist yeah there you go like i I think there's got to be you know a middle there that's you know you know you're able to order things but you're also not raping people you know that might be a somewhere between there is probably where you want to be well you know if 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 those are the goalposts. Uh, at least I feel good about being kind of in the middle there somewhere. Definitely. Like, yeah, it, because you absolutely do need to contend with chaos and mingle with it. And you have to, you, you have to order some, but you can't order it all. So there's definitely a, a sweet spot there. Although like between like rape and ordering too much, there's, there's a lot of room for for uh that sweet spot. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't 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 order things too much and don't rape. Yeah, like there <laughs> there's a a lot of livable area between those two, you know, things where you could live a, a good, happy, honorable life that you know, you're not harming other people unnecessarily and and then ironically enough, a pretty good uh, guide to living a good life is the words of the high one, a.k.a. Odin. Yeah, and that just, well, maybe he knows because he did all the bad things. He's like, oh, that didn't work. I don't know. It's, that's one of the things about uh, Norse mythology is that it's not, there isn't necessarily a lot of coherence between stories. And... Part of that could be that it's been lost, other or just not written down. They, there were likely many other stories that were uh, passed on through an oral tradition that just never got written down or got lost uh, through conversion and and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I guess that's sort of where we're at is that it's confusing and terrible and yeah. No, but but this was a good story though. It, yeah. it, it illustrated a lot of things about well about o- Odin and Thor, but also about kind of these ideas of well ordering the world too much. Like that's that's something you can't do. And I mean, for all of all, all his nobility, Thor still can't seem to get out of his mold. And Odin's like, <laughs> we're not going to beat this any further to death, but. For all of his negatives, Odin still has a point. That's maybe the, that's maybe the idea. Ah, I feel I feel compelled to say it. That was not me justifying his behavior. That was just like on a symbolic level. He's got, he's got a point. He's got a point of interacting with chaos and the combination of the two of them. If if we're not being like kind of flipping about a lot of livable room there, it's. I think the message becomes something like you you have to embrace both and that's the the proper way to live as a hero is to embrace chaos put it into order where you can and and constantly be on that edge and Thor and Odin both do that in their own way but neither of them kind of gets it exactly right I think that's the implication here because neither of them comes out 
looking perfect here. And well, Odin definitely not, but Thor also has kind of his down points too. And maybe it is the implication that he represents a part of society that's just trying to hold on, it's trying to order, 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 but it's ultimately futile. For sure. And I think, I actually, I, I think that uh, Balder would actually be considered the the proper way through in that, you know, he's he's the most beloved and brightest of the gods. So I'm going to assume that means there is no rape with Balder that, well, and, and he's qu- like pretty happily married as far as I, I remember. So, but he's also, you know, the best at fighting and all and impervious to most uh, weapons other than mistletoe. So there's, uh, and then, you know, sort of, once the uh, the world is reborn, he's sort of the, the he is the top of the hierarchy. So you're you're kind of seeing the the uncomfortable uh, like birth pangs of like you've got a good example over here of like ordering things, and then a I'll say I'll say a good example of mingling with chaos, not not good in a honorable way, but just in a capable way of, yeah, he can deal with chaos, no problem. And then with Balder, he's, he's got one foot in both camps, which is sort of the, the proper way to be, to be alive and living. Yeah. He integrates that in, in an extreme way. Definitely. The the next time we visit anything to do with the death of Balder is, is going to be fun because we've, we've certainly learned a lot since the first time we we covered it. So. For sure. Uh, I think that's going to be it for this uh, this poem, though. It's It's been a fun one. I, I think you can probably see why we said it was interesting at the beginning there, because it certainly was. And, uh, well, but, but it was... I, I like it a lot to see the differences in their personalities and see the difference in what that implies as far as how society is structured and how to live in the world. So that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, it was a neat... Uh... A neat poem, and it is funny, like, when you first see the poem, it's just flighting, it's just Odin and Thor insulting each other, but, you know, if you want to be nerds and read into it, there's there's stuff there that, I would say that actually adds up and makes sense, you know, that I don't think we shoehorned anything into it too hard. No, I, I, I don't think so. Definitely there was a, there were a few things where the symbolism made sense, so yeah, hopefully we didn't make too big of a mess of it, yeah. so... I guess we'll uh, make our usual acknowledgements here. So again, we, we're reading the uh, Poetic Edda, translated by Jackson Crawford, and uh, published by Hackett Publishing. Thank you to the both of them for letting us use their book. It's a fantastic translation of the Poetic Edda, and we highly recommend it. If you'd like to follow along with us, we'll have a link up to the uh, where you can purchase it on Amazon. And uh, his his YouTube channel on Norse mythology and uh, Norse language and a whole bunch of other things is another very valuable resource that we'd recommend very highly. So I'll also link to that. And of course, it would be uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the influence of Dr. Jordan Peterson in our work. His university lectures and biblical series are a profound influence on what we're doing here. We certainly wouldn't have started this show without the inspiration of specifically his biblical series. We'll post links to his YouTube channel where his university lectures and biblical series are located, as well as to his website where he's got a fantastic reading list of uh, lots and lots of books if you want to learn more about kind of the ideas that we're exploring here. And uh, I'll also just mention here that if you would like to get in touch with us, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all variations on Northern Myths. I think we're at Northern Myths for Twitter and Facebook, and uh, Instagram is Northern Myths Podcast. Uh, you can email us at Northern Myths Podcast at gmail.com. And uh, we're also both personally on Twitter, North Myth Luke and North Myth Dan. And we'd love to get in touch with you. Every Everyone who gets in touch with us is just awesome to, to hear from you. It's uh, awesome to get comments. Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind if... Uh, if uh, you would write a review on iTunes or your podcast platform of choice, it really does does uh, make a difference for us. It's uh, the easiest way you can support us at this point. And, you know, if you want to share us on social media, we definitely appreciate that as well. 
that again, it's a, just the easiest way you can support us. If you think we've been, uh, you know, doing a good job with this, we definitely appreciate a review or a share. So that would be fantastic. Is there anything else I haven't covered? No, I think that about covers all of it. So really there's only uh, one thing left to do and that's for all of us to uh, go find the myth that we're living. Perfect. This has been Northern Myths Podcast. Till next time. Thanks for listening.